Okay, so I think, guys, we might go ahead and I uh, got a little a short introduction here, um, and then uh, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm hoping Josiah rolls in. Maybe I just am not scrolling all the way down. He said he was in. Um, but I have to get reused to doing big meetings in Jitsi. All right, well, anyway, I'll just go ahead and start the introduction, and uh, hopefully Josiah is in here. Um, so, uh, yeah, and every guys, welcome to the third ever Pasadena Second Realm Assembly, the first meeting of our Department of Technology live here on Jitsi uh, and was supposed to be streamed to the Pasadena Committee Correspondence Telegram group. But, um, yeah, I'll work on that next time. Um, anyway, uh, you can obviously find, a, find us here. Find us here next time. Um, Pasadena.com forward slash, forward slash assembly three um, is uh, the permanent link. So you can always visit that for, for any assembly. Um, so, um, yeah, if you're new to the Free Republic, Pasadena is the first free country in existence right now. A decentralized country spanning, uh, spanning worldwide jurisdictions. Our goal is to create a parallel network founded upon the principles of truth, peace, and voluntarism. These here are our second realm assemblies, where we crowdsource the topic of liberation. The current projected schedule uh, is as such. We will have two of them a month, one being a general assembly, the other being a meeting for our Department of Technology. And uh, I think we might be getting a little feedback on your end. Welcome, brother. But, but uh, um, let me see here. Where was I? Yeah, so these are our second realm assemblies where we crowdsource the topic of liberation. Uh, the current projected schedule is as such. Uh, we'll have two of them a month, one being a general assembly, uh, the other being a meeting for our Department of Technology, uh, hence tonight. Uh, to ensure you never miss a post or a meeting, subscribe to the Vonnie podcast on your favorite podcatcher and uh, follow on Odyssey. Um, those two places, um, everything gets posted there. I realized that the last post didn't get posted on the podcast feed, so I'm mentioning, mentioning Odyssey to VonniePodcast.com forward slash Odyssey 1. Uh, you can also begin or continue building your reputation in the second realm uh, by joining our Pasnia Committee of Correspondence. Uh, that's t.me forward slash Pasnia Chat. Uh, anyway, let's get on with it. Don't trust verify is a common and wise saying within the Bitcoin and open source realms. And uh, well, basically advisable in all circumstances. With the Pasnia network, we're seeking to build a trusted, decentralized community of self-liberators all over the world. Beyond advantages in physical space and time, this network and community can also help in shoring up the couple of pressing operational security items when it comes to the Tor network and uh, the use of things like VPNs or Bitcoin full nodes. Uh, that is, to my knowledge... Uh, largely unknown third parties, and the possibility of hijacked Tor exit nodes. Uh, so in this third Pasnia Second Realm Assembly, the agenda is as follows. Um, the great Pasnia Bitcoin mines. Uh, Tucson Bitcoin is here to discuss the prospects, uh, logistics, security considerations, advantages, and more of a Pasnia Bitcoin mining network. Um, we'll talk about trusted Bitcoin nodes. Uh, instead of connecting to an unknown full node or custodial, you know, custodial nodes, uh, ping a trusted Pasnia node instead. Um, and I think this is uh, probably an easy one that could get set up, um, potentially. But I think that is, uh, that is uh, really important. Um, next is Start9 with Dave, which uh, Dave is here. I know that. So uh, we'll see how the Start9 system uh, can help us build out the Pasni network in the here and now. And uh, I guess finally, um, the, the, main, the other big topic for today is the Second Realm Tour uh, and VPN network. I remember talking to Matthew here on, our podca on uh, the Vani podcast. Um, I don't know, it was a couple months back, and the topic of you know v VPNs and Tor came up, and he just was like, "Why don't we do our own?" And I was like, "That's the attitude I like. Let's do it." So um, we'll learn a bit more about uh, about how that could potentially happen today. Um, and really, I think just because um, I think there's a lot of confusion between VPNs and Tor, and you know when to use when to use each, and um, and all of that. So I think uh, you know um, so we got some really smart folks here. We can probably um, get some of those answers or get, get some of those questions answered. And uh, I guess uh, your questions and whatever else. This is an assembly, so if you've got any other you know topics. Um, anything you want to talk about, uh, the floor is open. So in addition to Tucson Bitcoin, uh, Dave and Matthew Raymer, um, speakers will likely include, include Jamie Baconic, uh, Dave from Start9, um, Josiah uh, from the Pasnia Bitcoin General Fund, uh, Thomas Friedman, who's here uh, from Pirate Box, and um, well, I'm, calling, I'm jokingly calling uh, you know, HBO star Jason Henza is also here, um, repping the Start9 shirt too, which is good to see. Um, and uh, he's taking the initiative on our own mesh network setup. Um, which uh, yeah wasn't yeah didn't have any involvement from me. He just uh, you know started a group and it's taking off and I'm, I love to see it. I love to see it. Um, so I will say of course I'm happy to have all of you here, but I'm even more ecstatic um, about uh, getting Matthew and Jamin on the same call. Uh, Jamin's expertise in uh, you know regarding hardware and software, and uh, Matthew's respective expertise in custom software solutions and networking. Um, yeah, we're definitely in for a treat. Definitely in for a treat. So, um, so we'll stick to the, I guess, stick to the docket in order of discussion, so we can get some stuff covered. But of course, we want people to chime in. So uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, do so. 
uh, whenever the mood strikes. So, and most sincere thanks for being here and uh, for being some of the most committed self liberators out here. Um, but uh, before I open up the floor, one final thing. Uh, one of our paths in diplomatic relations uh, is with the free territory of Sekistan. Um, the paths of our friend Sek Magora um, from the Agora podcast, who is here. Um, but I did get word that it was actually his birthday tomorrow. So I want to take a moment and uh, wish you, Sek, a uh, joyous and liberated birthday. So um, we were talking about some of the stuff you put out before, and you, you do a lot of uh, important stuff. So I appreciate you and glad, uh, glad you're here and happy birthday. Early birthday, I guess. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, another another trip around the sun. How did you find <laughs> that out? Oh, I guess I, <laughs> sneaky, a little sneaky. birdie. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I need to work on the security culture. <laughs> Apparently, I have terrible security culture. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, no thanks. Yeah, tomorrow's my birthday. I think I'm turning thirty nine, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, an old bastard. <laughs> Gotcha. Right on. Well, uh, anyway, I guess, um, yeah, I hope it's a seller one. And uh, I guess let's see it. See if I can scroll up and down on this thing now. I'm not sure if it'll let me. I don't know if. Oh, there we go. There's a couple other rows. So, uh, okay, I do see Alex here. That's great. Um, I do not see, I'm not sure who LCK is. Um, I guess a Josiah would be the one we'd start with here. If uh, Josiah is here in whatever fashion. But I'm not sure. Okay. So anyway, um, hopefully he'll uh, hop in. Uh, so it's Lauren, I suppose. So welcome, Lauren, um, to the General Assembly, or the, I guess the Second Realm Assembly. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I guess we'll we'll, we'll wait. Uh, hopefully Josiah will hop in, and uh, for I guess just to start then, um, I guess we'll start with Start Nine maybe. Um, so uh, um, Dave, you here with us, brother? Yeah, is my audio coming through clean enough? Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Well, uh, well welcome. Thanks for being here, man. Um, so I, I know you've you've been, um, I guess you've been working with Start Nine for for some time now, and I, I honestly don't know a whole lot about it. I've I've seen it around, and from what I've seen, I, I'm I'm really really uh, really excited about it. Um, so uh, I guess could you uh, you know give us a rundown of uh, you know about Start Nine, and uh, I guess uh, maybe a little I guess a little background introduction to yourself too. Yeah, definitely. First of all, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. So uh, thanks for having me. I've been listening to your stuff for many, many, many years and uh, had the pleasure of visiting Pazni a couple times as well. Mm -hmm. So thanks for having me. Um, start nine. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on myself just for the sure. <laughs> sake of uh, keeping the conversation rolling and on a point of technology. I think um, start nine is very interested in uh, the goal of rebuilding the Internet from the ground up. Uh, and that sounds like a lofty goal, and a lot of people have kind of had that aim before. Uh, but we uh, take the perspective of starting with what is uh, immediately practical and then uh, kind of working up from that foundation. Uh, and so we found the immediately practical and necessary first step is that people own their own servers, which allows them to then own their own data. Uh, and so we set up about um, creating Embassy OS, which is a Linux-based operating system geared towards making it easy to uh, install and host your own server-side software. Now, if that sounds like mumbo jumbo to you, basically the idea is that rather than using something like a Google Drive, a Dropbox, um, or a Telegram, things of that nature, you can host your own software and the experience is as easy as installing uh, apps on your smartphone. Um, the difference being this is done uh, through your browser to a device that you own about the size of a router uh, and just like a router, you can set it down uh, in your home and kind of forget about it. it. Might need to be turned off and on again every now and then, but that's about it. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. So I guess um, <clears throat> um, so the I know with Jamin was very and he's been working with um, a project project called Freedom Box for a while, um, and that's what he's uh, I guess re he's really into. Um, could you do you know anything about Freedom Box? And I guess could you I guess maybe uh, and I guess the other systems that are out there. Um, could you, um, you know, I guess maybe tell us a little, I guess how, how start nine is different. Yeah. Um, so freedom box is very similar idea. Uh, I don't know when I first came across them, but, um, you know, this is a kind of a, um, a space where we kind of expect this to be an entire industry in the near future. And so the more projects, the better, uh, in, in our opinion, um, but very similar idea. I mean, the approaches are slightly different. I don't know exactly what their technology stack is. It's been a long time since I've played with it, um, but uh, totally, totally similar visions. Uh, I think they are 
focused on the server. We do intend to, uh, especially here in 2023, move into the realm of networking um, and uh, kind of expand because um, after we move from like the sovereignty over data, uh, we want to have sovereignty over our networks such that we can start sidestepping ISPs um, and holding these um, uh, choke points such as fiber connections across the internet and things like that, or across the uh, ocean and things like that, holding those centralized points uh, accountable to the, uh, to the people more broadly. Uh, and we do that by controlling our networks regionally. So we have uh, maybe a little bit bigger scope in mind. Um, we also intend to move into the realm of uh, sort of IoT devices uh, later this year, hopefully, which would be this idea that you can have cameras, security systems, um, you know, drones, uh, smart assistants, uh, things of that nature that don't phone home to these big tech companies. There's no reason for that data to ever leave your home network unless you choose to share it. And if you do choose to share it, there should be a convenient way to anonymize that data and to be paid for that data. So for example, uh, fitness tracking data, for example, you might want to um, hand over some data that's been anonymized such that it might be useful to uh, medical researchers, but that it doesn't actually hand over any of your personally identifying information. And there's no reason that you shouldn't be paid for that data because it belongs to you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, I guess Matthew, Matthew, um, you're, yeah, I guess you're well versed in, in I guess in the space. Um, do you, um, I guess do you have any, any thoughts on start nine, I guess, in, in terms of, um, how it could be used for, for, for Pasnia? Um, and I guess, um, and I guess Dave, after that, if you could speak to kind of user friendliness of it too, cause that's a really, that's, that's really important. But Matthew, if you have anything. Well, one thing <clears throat> I'll just say at the outset, so everyone knows where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm kind of, a eclectic developer and i'm involved in lots of different projects at the moment uh one is a, a service that i'm offering to uh the content creation space which is called content safe and we're really big advocates even though our service works primarily on alternative video platforms which are on the normal internet we're really big advocates of people content creators owning their own content and being the primary distribution point for content and to that to that end uh, i'm working with tom thomas breedman here uh we're doing some work together i'm helping him consult on building something that's specifically geared for that toward content creation uh and at the same time i know dave was talking about self-sovereign identity essentially and uh, a little bit later, Trent, one of my other friends here, is going to be presenting a few minutes of uh, mm. a system I'm helping him with that directly addresses communities and uh, trust and being able to share only information you want shared. So uh, nice. I, I've heard of Start9, and I, I think you guys are really great. It, it, I, and I agree with you 100% that uh, we can't really be like saying well we're going to be the only person who does this because that's not really how this is going to work out that we have to be able to uh proliferate different projects and actually one of the things that trent and i <clears throat> in our project are trying to emphasize is creating widgets that interoperate and not trying to build this massive thing that does everything and maybe dave uh what do you think about that idea of just focusing in on a particular widget or or service or that could be used by many other projects? Yeah, definitely. So our uh, you know creating a Linux distribution, which is what we did, is not you know that's that's obviously nothing new. There are probably thousands of Linux distributions out there uh, at this point, and uh, there's no reason that so. Uh, oh speaking to open protocols like you are there are um, currently we have a method of uh, wrapping up an image uh, of existing open source software say for example uh, a bitcoin node uh, such that it will speak to embassy os and basically what that means is that uh, it takes all of the systems administration uh, that many of the folks on this call are probably used to getting in the command line writing config files and it makes that uh, into an easily approachable a user interface, a graphical user interface, uh, such that, um, you know, 
quote unquote anyone can do it right now there is um, going to be a learning curve regardless so this isn't something like um, you know like when the first smartphones came out uh, mm -hmm. kids were using them and teaching their parents how they worked and now everybody's using them and we sort of expect it to be a similar thing now there's no reason that um, embassy OS uh, can't be one of several other systems which kind of use either use this packaging system that we've created uh, in mm -hmm. order to share server-side packages that are simple to use, um, or um, you know, potentially networking protocols. Obviously, everything we use um, on the back end is all open source, so those are all open protocols as well. We definitely think it's important to um, to have interoperability uh, with open systems and to remain open ourselves. So um, all our code is uh, obviously source available, so on and so forth. Uh, what kind, just out of curiosity, what kind of containerization are you using? So currently we use Docker because it is the sort of the best community, the best supported. However, we built the system with modularity in mind. And so Docker is not a prerequisite, <clears throat> excuse me, that cool. would set us apart a little bit from um, the quote unquote Bitcoin node projects that are out there, such as uh, Umbral, Raspi, Blitz, MyNode, uh, that are kind of dependent on Docker and Docker Hub. Uh, this was built from the ground up to be an operating system rather than to be a uh, a Bitcoin node. So we are not, cool. um, while Bitcoin is an available service, we are not opinionated about the, the software that you run. If you prefer to run uh, Nextcloud or a different cryptocurrency, those are your decisions as a user and uh, are not in our hands. Um, so <clears throat> Have you considered uh, something to work with Swarm? Uh, you know, to, to be able to, yeah, Docker Swarm, something to be able to task many boxes together, perhaps. Yeah, so you can actually think of Embassy OS as a container management system uh, with an approachable graphical uh, user interface. So, um, like I said, it's modular, so we don't depend on Docker. So uh, cool. in future, there might be something like, um, you know, uh, Podman or, or Downlower, we might have something replacing Run C or something like that. Um, but the idea is that it is a, an operating system that is foundationally built to make it easy to run a server to basically allow anyone to be a systems administrator uh, without having to dig around in the command line and um, you know the, all the hazards that come with that as well as the uh, unapproachable learning curve that comes with that can I ask a interject mm -hmm. a question here about your um, your API for for the for the start nine part now you mentioned modularization that you you created a a way that you can interface with these uh, these server these these command line server tasks in the background and present them in a user interface. And I've seen that, it's very, very, very clean and polished. I like it a lot. Do you have a specification that distills that work so that so that we could build something that fits into that same uh, modular design? Um, could you give me an example of, of what you'd like to build in or something that you might like to build in? Because there's well, two different I'm, directions I could go with that. Well, I would say that uh, just about any server application, I mean, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the general applications of IPFS would be one thing, which I know you guys are working on, but that's just one example. Any server-based application is going to have some type of configuration, and, and are you going to normalize that and present it, or how do you create a GUI that interacts with the background task is basically what, okay. it, what I'm asking. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. That's a great question. So uh, the the way that we handle individual, we, we, so we, we kind of uh, have this idea that we call the things on our uh, that the the software that runs on our system we refer to those as services and the reason that we do that to differentiate from applications and you know time will tell whether or not this terminology sticks but the idea is that the a service would be a server side component and an application would be a client side component so for example uh, we did recently package and release uh, ipfs now ipfs has um, kind of two components so it has um, it actually runs on embassy OS as a daemon. And so the uh, interface that you have with it is uh, limited to uh, your basic user configuration. Um, and it lists out your interfaces and properties if there are any, um, I don't know if there are any for IPFS, it's a pretty simple service. But then what we do is we have instructions to link that to the IPF, IPFS companion uh, browser extension such that you can um, click on that browser extension, click my node, and you have the entire user interface that you're used to. Um, some other services such as, let's say, um, 
Vault Warden, for example, which is a, a, a Bitwarden fork for uh, written in Rust specifically for self-hosting, uh, that has its own web UI. So in, uh, in our interface, you could click on the web UI and it would launch open just like it would um, in any other way. And you can also link that to your browser extensions, your desktop applications, your mobile apps, so on and so forth. Um, so in regards to the API, there's um, this notion of packaging a service. We call them wrappers. And this is uh, what I was talking about, the ability to speak to the operating system, or in other words, to take all these interfaces and properties um, that would be configured by the uh, package developer or the upstream developer uh, and, and convert that. And it's kind of a creative process because you, the developer, can decide um, you know, what the end user is going to see in their in their UI and uh, what configuration options are available and so on and so forth. And obviously you want to make it as customizable as possible, but the more customizable then the more defaults you need to set, which makes it a little bit opinionated uh, and also adds some complexity. But basically yeah, we'll have that's, this. That's kind of what I was looking for, David, was the uh, the, the documentation for that, that what, what, you, what you're using, that wrapper layer that you're using to encapsulate the back end and, and interface to the front end through the operating system. Do you have a specification or anything that would be a guide or some examples of, of how that would work? We do, yeah. So um, all our documentation is at docs, D-O-C-S dot start nine, S-T-A-R-T, the number nine dot com. And there is the kind of quick and dirty route is the um, uh, the tab there called uh, service packaging. And that'll give you a, yep, that's correct, docs.start9.com. The service packaging is kind of a quote unquote one pager. It's actually several pages, but you can scroll through that and that gives you uh, the basic understanding of how a package is put together, how a wrapper is put together. And then we also have a specification on there. That's a little bit dated. Uh, it will give you all of the information that you need, but um, that is in the process of an update as well. So uh, the specification is a bit dated. We've, we're moving pretty quickly. We're still you know, uh, sort of in beta, I guess you could say it works very well. We have a lot of users, but we're not at a 1.0 stage yet. So things are still kind of moving pretty quickly. And so the uh, documentation can sometimes fall a bit behind uh, and the specification is the furthest behind of, of the docs at the moment, but the one page um, service packaging guide is, is up to date. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, it looks like Josiah just was uh, able to hop in. Welcome Josiah. Um, and uh, so I, I guess I want to ask since we're, we've we're, or, I mean, so you, so you mentioned, so Dave, you mentioned with start nine that. um, you want to like, I guess, rebuild the internet from the ground up, essentially, and that's obviously we got to have our own infrastructure. Um, and uh, now, I, as far as like the networking and how that would look, you know, um, physically, how you know, with like mesh network repeaters mm -hmm. or however the hell that would look, I have no idea. Um, but we've got Henza here, who's I guess who's been focusing on that. Uh, Matthew, who um, you know, you you mentioned, I guess, I don't know, I, I remember, I, I remember it's uh, seeming a lot like pretty easy. Uh, we're like, oh, we'll just do it ourselves. So I guess, um, could we talk about like how to how to actually, I guess. Um, how to actually build the internet from the ground up. Um, and I guess maybe it might be a more simple task to start with. Our own VPN Tor network might be a good, I, I don't know, micro example of that. Um, but I don't know. I'll, I guess I'll maybe turn it over to you to start, Matthew. You know, uh, don't misinterpret me. I can be kind of flippant. But it, it's not exactly what I'd call an easy task to replace the internet. But I think that uh, whatever we create is going to look really kind of different than what we presently have. And that's why I'm kind of curious to hear what some of the other people have to say. I could talk a bit about Tor, but that's kind of limited to person to person and small group communication. Uh, I think that it should be fairly standard for small groups to use uh, some sort of encrypted technology. Uh, but that that's that's all I can really say right now. Uh, okay. Let someone else speak. Sure. <laughs> sure. I did have a question real quick for you, Dave. Um, so with the embassy.os um, services and systems, can you use your own server with that? Or does it have to be the ones that are um, that, that they purchased from you? Because I was just concerned, concerned about like if somebody to tries to connect to that network with their own server that's not hardened some Cisco router that's trash or a Cisco server 
that has all kinds of back doors in it, uh, it would degrade the overall security for the rest of the individuals um, connected to that network. I mean, how accurate is that? Or uh, is that possible? Do you have to use your servers to, to, to get on that network? Uh, yeah, so I'll start by saying um, it, it's not a network. So it's an operating system similar to the way that uh, uh, Ubuntu or uh, Mac OS are an operating system. So this is the interface uh, between you and the uh, services that are running uh, behind that. So, um, but the best part about Embassy OS, to address the first part of your question, is that it is open source and it is not something that, you know, you don't have to purchase anything from us. We do uh, we do sell plug and play devices in order to pay the bills and so on and so forth. Uh, but you are more than welcome. Uh, we recently, uh, just a few months ago, expanded to x86 support. So if you have an old desktop or an old laptop um, or a mini PC or something like that, you can uh, download our software and put it on that device. Now, there are some uh, limitations and uh, I can post a uh, list of known good hardware and known possible issues with some hardware. Um, but if you get something like an old thin client for a couple hundred bucks, you can run this software and have your own um, have your own server at home. And that server, to speak to the network side just briefly, is uh, if you have it at your home or office, that's going to be firewalled um, behind your router. And so the requests in and out are uh, generally over Tor. There are exceptions to that. Um, and we are working on some new uh, remote connection options because Tor, especially this year, unfortunately, has been under heavy uh, DDoS attacks and has become mm -hmm. unreliable and, and slow, especially for um, some of the types of use cases that, uh, that we want to make a little bit uh, more comfortable. So um, the solutions that we're going to implement to that will begin uh, with the MVP of basically um, interoperating with the regular quote unquote clear net, uh, meaning using IP addresses the same way that uh, most of the internet does. Uh, and then we will uh, quickly shift that to where you can run your own uh, VPN. You can use a VPS and tunnel all your connections through that. Uh, and there's also a lot of uh, interesting developments right now around this idea of uh, you doing hole punching, that is to say uh, NAT router hole punching through uh, discovery servers uh, and other sort of uh, rendezvous points. Uh, some of the technologies that do this already are uh, hole punch, uh, sync thing, IPFS, uh, Noster is getting very popular right now because it's a very simple protocol. Um, and you can do this with just about anything. You can do this with Tor, in fact. So we've also experimented with creating a connection via Tor or I2P uh, and then using that uh, or, or creating a uh, d discovery rendezvous via Tor or I2P or something similar, and then creating a direct uh, VPN connection that's encrypted um, between your client and your server in that way. So uh, a lot of that will be coming here in the next few months. So I must I might have been confused then when you were first uh, mentioning it because the what was the device that you had mentioned about having it was a small router that was for that you guys had available. Yeah, so uh, the first thing that we the, that we built is a server. So it's a small box that you would plug directly into your router, uh, and you would use that at home. And this is where you're storing your data and hosting uh, server side software, uh, whether that's a chat server or a cryptocurrency node or um, you know, cloud storage, what have you. Um, you can think of this as uh, there's there's an adage that the cloud is just somebody else's computer. In this case, the cloud is still your computer. You don't have to reach out to Google, uh, Apple, Amazon, Facebook in order to get permission to use your own data, your own digital property. Uh, now, we do intend to um, expand into the networking realm later this year. Uh, and the way that we're going to do that is a little bit experimental still. So I don't want to kind of comment and shoot myself in the foot on the way that we're going to do that. But uh, there will be uh, ways to most likely to uh, repurpose existing routers in the same way that you could repurpose an old desktop into a server. Uh, it'll probably look something like that, where you can uh, use some existing open source um, systems on your router. And then uh, potentially they would, uh, or, or ideally, we're going to uh, link them so that it's a smooth experience with Embassy OS. Okay. And uh, ideally, the operating system would be uh, fluid across many devices, so your server, your router, um, so on and so forth. How much uh, storage do you guys have available on those devices? Uh, currently, we're selling one and two terabyte devices, and I think we're getting ready to move to four terabyte just because the storage prices are coming down. However, if you choose to build your own, you, the sky's the limit. We do have uh, some people starting to experiment now with uh, 
hardware RAID such that they can uh, really have a, a high amount of uh, data storage available. And we, we want to also uh, add some storage options this year, such as um, uh, explicit NAS and uh, RAID support. Yeah, I, in my perspective, uh, what we're seeing is the need for like multi terabyte, like 16, 32 terabyte systems. And that would be very appealing, not only to us in house, but also to our clients. Um, I, I know one of my content creators that's in my alpha program, uh, his shows are 20 gig each. And then you got to include uh downsized versions for different devices on top of that so his corpus is like 300 shows he's probably got 16 to 20 terabytes of data and it would be nice to have micro a micro device to pitch to someone like that that they could put into their house and be the distribution point for an ipfs uh, network yeah, definitely. Um, and we'd also like to move. Uh, so content creators are definitely really high on our uh, sort of, um, I hate marketing, but quote unquote, target audience. Um, the idea being that we know uh, this problem exists where content creators are having to bounce all over the place with this cat and mouse game getting censored left and right, um, because it's no longer acceptable to say certain things or think certain thoughts. Uh, and so that is, um, that is the main reason that we are targeting this uh, ClearNet uh, approach um, instead of Tor, because obviously Tor is completely um, untenable for content creators. So uh, we're going to be um, releasing uh, software updates to the OS. All, all software updates are free, of course, uh, with the software um, that you uh, allow content you creators. Mentioned that. You mentioned right. NAS support. Do you, are, will you be integrating a, a NAS GUI or will you be integrating with specific NAS supporters so that uh, so it's more of a seamless uh, integration with, with any particular NAV devices to pro provide for these large uh, volume uh, pr uh, publishers? Uh, we don't have a specific plan on that right now. We're definitely still kind of in the research phase, but we always go first to um, existing solutions, existing open solutions. So for example, maybe something like true NAS is something that we would want to have a, um, an easy integration with now, as far as what that's going to look like. Uh, I'm not exactly sure whether we're going to, um, you know, we could potentially, uh, we are kind of, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're making our, um, we're paying the bills with, uh, hardware sales. So we may choose to partner with a NAS company and white label, a, a NAS device for sale. And then anything that that company sells would obviously be the easiest to integrate. Um, but we want to keep that support um, open. So uh, anything that's uh, running on open protocols would, would probably be the target there. And what you mentioned earlier about uh, hole punching had just come up in a meeting in the last two weeks with one content creator that was trying to establish his own IPFS network it, with one of his uh, viewers was willing to host an IPFS node in Europe and they could never get the IPFS node to connect anywhere because of the way the ISP was set up. Mm -hmm. uh, so doing some sort of hole punching that I'd really like to know more. I did a little bit of homework, but that that's not really my strength. I'm a back end developer and not a network guy. So uh, I would like to know more about that. And, if you guys develop anything, uh, feel free to drop me some information. <laughs> I'd be yeah, curious so to know whether or not in that particular example, whether the guy was using the standard 4001 port to connect with or whether he changed the port number and the configuration, because that would be one way to get around that problem. If the IP, if the ISP is, is specifically targeting I, I, IPFS, or whether or not they have a range of ports in the high end that's open, which is pretty common for most IPs don't bother with, with locking it down really tightly so uh because it, it has too much of an impact on many services to do that so i suspect if you picked a higher port number they might have been able to get through but they might not have had that idea they may not have and in fact i'll bring that up i'll have an opportunity to talk with them again in a week or so and uh, it, it seemed to me that it, it did seem a little strange because they said they had a dual router set up uh that the ISP had a, well, of course, that kind of makes sense anyway, doesn't it? Uh, anyway, 
guys, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, That's this is actually something we've been doing a ton of research on recently because this is, you know, what we're leading up to. We are, uh, you know, so first of all, to briefly describe the problem of, um, of uh, NAT traversal for those who are not aware, um, every network such as a home network, an office network, uh, where you have a router, um, that is a private network. So um, theoretically, you can have that network and all those devices can communicate uh, and you don't actually have to plug into the wider internet. Okay, so that is a, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, a piece on its own. Okay, so when you plug into the broader internet, um, the devices that are on that private network, they all have their own IPs on it, their own IP range. And that range is not the same range as the uh, connection that the router has. And so we have this problem where you need to reach a device within the network that has a different IP range than the router knows about, or that the, the broader internet knows about, I should say. And so uh, the, the biggest problem uh, with NAT hole punching is reaching specific devices uh, without having to do uh, port forwarding and things like that on the router. And from our perspective, this is a kind of a user, um, an ease of use type of thing because um, it's not particularly difficult, but we do want to avoid router configuration. Now, um, and the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because we're getting to the point where we, we do have several users, in fact, already that report uh, their ISPs um, being unfriendly to Tor traffic, for example. And so uh, one of the main reasons to use Tor is that it can do that NAT hole punching as a VPN of sorts uh, by definition. But we want to have this, uh, the eventual goal here, uh, hopefully later this year, is that we want to have all these different possibilities where you can make connections uh, to the outside world um, by a sort of, uh, you know, list of priorities that, that is probably defined by the user. So you may choose first, I want to try and connect um, via, you know, and I, I think hopefully we'll eventually move uh, the IPFS uh, protocols to the OS layer as well as having the, the service, because I think that'll be useful. But you may choose, I want to do my hole punching via Tor, I want to use a VPN, I want to use I2P, we'll have all these different options and basically the user will be able to go from you know top to bottom and try each one um, until they get a successful connection because we're we're operating on this idea where we we still need to use the pipes that exist while we're mm -hmm. building this new uh, owner operated model of the internet and mm -hmm. so the the bigger we get and the more that we do this uh, as you know as we the people not we the company um, the more adversarial the ISPs are going to become. And so we're going to slowly have to start building out our own networks. And that's uh, sort of the next phase and a whole other story. Um, oh, yeah. yeah and, and, uh, hole and, punching is, is um, you know, that's the, the first step is to be able to connect to each other directly uh, and not have to worry about um, router configuration is the biggest hurdle. And whatever we end up creating, I as I said earlier, I, it's going to look really different than what we currently have. And uh, we need to count, count our blessings, so to speak, because I've often commented to people whenever they talk about, like, they're going to shut the Internet down, which they're not going to do. Uh, that let's suppose that we did lose uh, communication outside of our local uh, community. The technology we have on hand right now with the right knowledge would allow us to behave in a way very different than someone would have behaved a hundred years ago. So we need to count our blessings. Even though that internet might not look like what we have now, it will still be more powerful than anything our ancestors had. And I think it will come up with different use cases. Anyway, just me pontificating. Awesome. Well, that was uh, very, very, uh, yeah, informative. I appreciate that those explanations, Dave, and uh, obviously Matthew and, and everyone else. That was uh, was good. I guess any other uh, any other comments on I guess uh, you know building the open internet or uh, um, Dave? Any other any other comments regarding Start Nine or any other questions regarding Start Nine? Um, yeah, I guess I'll open it up there.
I'll ask Dave if there's a way right now, like if Matthew and I were to buy uh, or install your OS to connect directly to each other, because um, if we do, then yeah, it's, it's something I would love to play with because that direct connection, I think, is one way we're going to start communities. Yeah, so uh, direct remote connections, if you wanted to, um, you know, for example, chat with each other. Uh, those are currently all done over Tor. So we have both a matrix server and we have um, a kind of proof of concept service that we rolled called Cups, which is just an extremely simple, uh, literally your username is just your Tor public key. Um, just to kind of, that this was one of the first apps that we put on, uh, or services, sorry, that we put on uh, the OS, uh, excuse me, the OS. But, um, but yeah, it is possible. Uh, again, as I said, Tor is not uh, the most reliable. This isn't going to be a uh, Telegram-like experience yet. Uh, we think that Matrix has a lot of maturation to do. Uh, Nostr may also um, provide some better capability for messaging, although it currently has no forward secrecy. And to be honest, the experience is pretty awful all around on the clients. True. Uh, we've been playing with it, and it's just not there yet. It's kind of pre-alpha. But um, yeah, it is possible. And as I said, you know, of course, we're happy to, uh, to accept your donation, but uh, you don't uh, need to give us a penny if you want to get started by uh, installing just to a virtual machine, for example. Uh, we have instructions for that. We have a pretty vibrant uh, community. We've got a forum, uh, lots of different chat channels where people are happy to answer your questions and a, a good knowledge database that you can look through and decide if it's the right tool for you. This is good because, uh, you know, you mentioned Tor keys. And, you know, when we start with that, we, I have my own private keys as uh, my security with somebody else. Um, and we can build that out because in the self-sovereign identity space that Matthew mentioned, you know, we're, we're starting to come up with real standards for decentralized IDs and communications and even data containers with the calling ACDCs uh, directly in between individuals. And so uh, maybe we could start growing one of those. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I think reputation is a, a big deal online. Um, you know, if we can, have assurances like, for example, with something like Briar, where you have to exchange keys in person. Um, I think it's a great idea to have these kind of key exchange parties and things like that, where you know mm -hmm. who it is that you're talking to on the other side, especially when there's no third party server that you got to trust, like you do with, um, you know, Telegram and Signal, uh, things of that nature. So yeah, the public public private key uh, infrastructure is a, a big part of uh, the future of the internet. Do you have a link that that I can post or that you can post on the chat over here for a, a forum link or something where people could get started, like the virtual machine that you mentioned that you can, you've got virtual machine containers you can you can build uh, start nine with? Could you uh, post that link over there so we can get so I can play around yeah. with it a little bit? Yeah, of course. So start nine.com will be the place to sort of you know from from where else all other branches can be found. I will post specifically the. Uh, uh, I posted here community.start9.com, which is our forum that's kind of new, but it's turning into our hub since it's uh, openly accessible and anyone can post there. Um, and I will post specifically a guide to run with a virtual manager. You can also use virtual box, but you need to uh, just bridge the network. Um, so I'll post some guides here. Hey, hey Shane. Yes. Uh, you think uh, I could... I think I could give Trent five or six minutes oh, yeah. to present his system. No. Please, yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, it's a great time to. Yeah, Trent, go for it, brother. All right. Go for um, it. Thank you. Uh, introductions have been uh, pretty quick, so I'll try and uh, speed this, but I will share uh, this screen um, <clears throat> to introduce it. Uh, the idea that we've been working on with Matthew uh, is to make commitments something that's engaging and user friendly. So, also, you know, use this to evolve communities and governance. So, for me, I start out with what is the world that I want to see. Um, I invite everybody to do this. In fact, I heard a word for this called backcasting uh, the other day. So, you know, envision what do you know we want in the future world, and these are the things I want and course, will manifest it as we make this part of our conversations. What drives me is this, by small and simple things are great things come to pass because I believe in the decentralization. 
And I think that we can get to large and larger systems governments starting small, starting with communities. So the idea is a Kickstarter for time right now, something that's easy enough for youth kids to use where they can share project descriptions, maybe with general locations, make it super easy for them. There's not even a login onboarding with the current app and enable discovery of some of that data with some selective disclosure when you want to go further based on self-sovereign identity. So, uh, you know, the goal, hey, let's encourage people coming up with ideas, including kids. I mean, if we get kids starting with the ideas of agorism and joining the other, then, you know, what does that build for their future? Um, I, I hope that this becomes into something that can really evolve governance because when you have somebody that says, Hey, I want to start a garden. Um, and you've got people around who might be interested, but you know what? I'm not going to jump in unless I know that there's five other people who are going to go that day. So let's make that the trigger point. Hey, okay. We've got five people with interest makes it happen. You know, this past summer, we had a bunch of people travel an hour to go help out a fellow voluntarist because we had a whole group that committed at the same time. So this also shines a light on our most precious resource, which is time. It's, I don't feel like it's money. I feel like money is going to go away eventually. So talking to the technology, since this is a tech group, I love this local first, you know, own your own data. Also start creating our own chains. We have trusted data in between us where we can make transactions. Let's start building those chains between people that uh, people that we already know and trust. The self-sovereign identity standards are out there. They're actually taking hold in some real enterprises and they're going to really support us in this kind of effort where we want to be very selective on who we create community with. Uh, the other part of that that's important is the underlying schema. The data format has to be open so that anybody can build on this network. And, you know, in this iteration, okay, I hold my own keys and also my own contracts. I can publish a hash of the contracts. We can know what contracts are popular, like on the uh, common paper contracts that are standard, but uh, I own the data and I can selectively disclose it. So, you know, development wise, we're iterating. Um, I've got a advanced user interface at endorsersearch.com. It's a mobile app that talks to a server, and, but you own as much data as you want, and you can selectively disclose more. It's the hard to use version. I use it every week with my group here in Bountiful, Utah. We uh, have a meeting, we check in and confirm each other's attendance, and that becomes a reputation over time. And these are locked with public private keys. So if you were to try out this app and install it, you just have to get Matthew or I to approve you on there. And then you can make um, uh, your own commitments or even join our project that's on there. Or you can hop on a test server and, and play around with that. So I would call for you to do that or you know, contact Matthew or I for the user-friendly version, which is this Kickstarter for time that we hope to make. Uh, ridiculously simple and easy to use. And then we start plugging projects together and you can visualize your own, but that's just a teaser for the future. So thank you. Any questions, comments are welcome. Trent, do you guys have any method of preventing abuse of the reputation system? So there's no inherent reputation built into it. It's right now directly between individuals. If you want to, uh, you know, you know anybody that's connected with you by one hop. If you see some information by somebody two hops away, you have to go through an intermediary. You say, hey, will you introduce me? And then you start building that, but there's no built-in ratings or, you know, reputation that way. So this is really focused on people you know. And if you're going into a realm of someone that's a second or third uh, hop from you, it relies on the people you know being trustworthy to uh, not refer you to someone that's untrustworthy. Yeah, when and you're going to get those introductions, you know, you're going to say, well, 
All right, I will introduce you to this person, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's uh, beware of such and such. Or yes, this is my best friend. I would trust him with my life. Let's get into this together. There's always ranges. So Matthew, it sounds like a um, sounds like a uh, I guess an in, I guess a physical a physical space and time version of scuttlebutt um, potentially uh, is what's coming to yeah. mind for me. Well, and we've even talked about uh, as we get ready for this integrating scuttlebutt into the system because scuttlebutt to me seems to be the direction we ought to be going. Yeah, that's an, always an inclination. I mean, I'm not right. uh, I'm not as technical as you guys, but that's kind of the inclination I had too. And we're working on dark lands and stuff like that. Scuttlebutt really just resonated with me back then, and it's always been kind of you know just in the background. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, even Thomas and and I we regularly communicate on Scuttlebutt now. Yeah. And, and we're actually in house of my company. We're planning to ditch. We've been using Keybase for about three years now. I, I, I adopted it right about the time Zoom bought it. So it, it was kind of like, well, okay, I don't really like this that Zoom bought it, but I'm going to keep using it for now until I feel that we can adopt uh, Scuttlebutt. And I think I'm at the point now I want to adopt Scuttlebutt <laughs> for in-house communication. That's good to hear. Yeah, that's good to hear. I was, yeah, I, I, I tested around with it. Um, I think Thomas and I were talking about it uh, maybe a month ago or something, and I actually, you know, I got got it uh, installed. I think on the Ghost tablet, maybe it was, and I was, you know, mess, you know, uh, tooling around with it, and it was, uh, yeah, pretty smooth. I guess just had to make more connections for it to be a better experience, obviously. But um, it seemed to be, um, you know, more. You know, it seemed to be a at a, a good user experience level, um, a lot further along than Nostra, I will say. Um, definitely, definitely a lot further. There are several, there are several different Scuttlebug clients. And the one that I posted on our uh, Pasnet group there was the newest one that seemed to be the most developed and the most refined. However, it's not compatible in some respects with the older versions. They still use, uh, they use a different database underlying. It's the same protocol. The wire protocol is the same, but, but there's a different database behind. In the previous versions, they kind of shared the common database. So that has advantages and disadvantages, but Matt and I have been playing around with Scuttlebutt for a while now, and the Maniverse uh, client that we've been using, it's clunky. Yeah. It's got some definite user yeah. interface things that need to be refined. So, so But, you know, to their credit, they are iterating their designs almost yes. on a weekly on a weekly t time scale. So th that's good. I mean, a lot of times you get something that goes out there and it's vaporware. You have one version and no one ever does anything with it. Uh, and guys, that's that. I, I don't know who I had this conversation with in the last three or four months, but it, I think it was someone outside of the anarchist, you know, vanuist, voluntarist space, and we were talking about privacy apps, uh, and and privacy projects. And I remember I did an audit like t ten years ago. I went through GitHub made a bunch of index cards just for me to look at a bunch of different projects. And I ended up with a stack of projects this thick and most of them are vaporware. And that could be because the developer wasn't really serious. It was just, you know, an experiment, but some of these actually had a lot of documentation and then they develop for a couple of years and they die. And I think that that we could be at the point where that could be turning around because people are actually interested in it now. So there's yeah, some good motivation. A, Go ahead. That kind of speaks to an ongoing problem in the open source and maybe even the broader anarchist communities of, um, you know, this idea that someone kind of starts working on a project and they might put their heart and soul into it and kind of expect some support from the community to, you know, help uh, bolster them up, you know, whether that's through um, developing code, if you're a developer, or if it's donations for their time, you know, to help them, uh, you know, be able to work on something like that full time, things like that. Um, so that's um, kind of an ongoing thing. It's very unfortunate that a lot of these projects uh, are just, um, you know, they're not up to par with what uh, the general populace are, is expecting when they use something like an iPhone, you know, and we want to get there. That's what we want to do. So we kind of have this hybrid model where we want to keep everything open uh, and um, in control of the users. Uh, but at the same time, we want to build a company such that we can guarantee that we're there. Uh, and, right. And one of the biggest parts really of Start9 
is the customer support. We want to, you know, looking around, especially during COVID, c- customer support, support just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, how many That's true. people on this call, possibly 100% have Gosh. seen, you know, or heard on the phone, uh, you know, due to overwhelming calls, so, you know, <laughs> coming in, it's like, no, th- you're just saying that because you're lazy and you don't actually want to put the effort into supporting your your product or your right. service. So, um, right. You know, that so both support, whether it's, you know, technical support, troubleshooting, things like that, and educational materials, whether that's our documentation, uh, video walkthroughs, we're going to start doing webinars uh, here this week, uh, things of that nature. We, we, we really want to help um, educate not just on what we do specifically, not just to sell products, but also on all of these underlying concepts, because there's so many, whether it's uh, Linux and systems administration and um hosting your own software, hosting your own data, cryptocurrencies. It just touches so many different uh, realms. Um, and uh, we want to, uh, you know, elevate the people along along with uh, what we're doing such that, you know, they can really take a hold and own this thing because we as a company cannot uh, do what we're talking about. Like I said, it's a lofty goal and it's not something that we, the company, expect to do. It's something that we expect we, the people, uh, to step up and do and own for themselves. Well. What well, what's the use in it if the people don't engage in it? Because mm-hmm. that's the that, that's where the real value is at is the growth of the community. Uh, one thing Trent might not have mentioned, you may have said it, Trent, but I'll just say it again. If you did say it, is that everything that we're producing is open source? Good deal. Good deal. Sounds to me like Freedom and these projects need a better marketing team then. Oh, absolutely. That definitely, definitely. Yeah. Freedom has a marketing problem these days. It seems like, <laughs> well, it, it, who the do problem you have is for it, your marketing. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, actually, so some are, of the best marketing that we get, honestly, is the fuck ups of big tech. I mean that when you see something <laughs> like LastPass, just, you know, having some complete <laughs> lack of, you know, security and, and basic practices, or, you know, mm-hmm. Apple saying oh, that, you know, we're going to start but, hashing but, all of your data. And if we see something that we think is inappropriate, then we're going to wipe it from our servers, you know, things like that. Right. Right. And, you know, the whole a- the whole AI thing right now with chat GPT, uh, one thing Trent and I've talked about is there's hundreds of ML projects out there that are open source that people could provide their own private ais and and i think that that's another frontier we need to be looking at and with all of the people who got probably useless degrees in machine learning there's a lot of people who have the skills but they don't have anything to do (laughs) Um, you're not right you're not wrong there matthew but i think those are all use cases those all are examples of use cases and reasons why people need these products i wouldn't call those marketing though like marketing is making no. people aware of the solutions. You know, um, what like mm-hmm. do you guys have um, a marketing team that you guys have that are developing funnels or landing pages? Um, that is you know, actually you know, copywriters. We do, have, we do have someone that is supposed to be helping us with that, right, Trent? You talked with Daryl. I did talk with him. He's been very busy lately, but uh, yes. Yeah. I will admit for our tool, it's it's early because we have to make something usable and it takes so much time to really make it usable, even for like just this group. Um, so yeah, that will take time, but you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, selling it the right way and determining what is the essence of your product, that's not gonna change because you can go in 20 different directions and kill your product. Um, but you're right, that's a huge uh, issue we gotta tackle. You just express the exact same problem that the Pirate Box version two is having. I mean, it's it's early stages of development. Matt and I have been having a lot of t- discussions about what tech stack inclusions we should make, and I'm I'm actually hired Daryl to do some of the marketing. He's done some work for me in that regard, but it's early. It's hard to put together a marketing plan to reach an audience that you haven't even got the technology behind that solidified yet. So it's. It's it's difficult, but you you don't want to you don't want to wait to the last minute and have everything done before you start the marketing. So there's there's some interviews and things that that can be done to to actually create some anticipation and some excitement in the market before you actually have the product ready. But you do have to have a handle around what that's going to be. That's not too far off, far off from what it's going to be, even though you may not know, may not know the details. 
Hey, hey Thomas, on, on know, that note, uh, oh, um, Thomas, on that note, would you mind taking a few minutes or taking a few minutes and uh, talking about Pirate Box? Um, yeah, go for it if you if you'd like. Yeah, I want I want to hear what Trent had to say real okay. quick to answer sure. that question. I think that's a good point about uh, the marketing. Um, in my world, I've been focused more on iterations, and so I've got an app like I showed that you can use today, but I wouldn't release it to the world. Uh, I just use it with friends. And the hope is to grow that and, and you know, take out small pieces that will become usable and, and grow that way rather than aiming for the right release, if that makes sense. And I, I hope that's not the wrong uh, approach, but that's my current approach. Okay. Well, I think I, you know a, a targeted release would be ideal within like the uh, Cyber Subi. He, he teaches a method called the the Halo method. They have of doing research on your target audience, and you know if we've, I know there's several several groups of individuals that have a plethora of email lists and contacts and all this stuff. You know, Tom Woods's contact list is going to be enormous. Um, so if there's some way to tap into these individuals to work with affiliate with some type of affiliate to program with the, with these larger individuals, um, but I, I suppose it's difficult when you're trying to sell a product that doesn't yet exist. But it, what is the product that collectively we're trying to create here? Is it the start nine? Is it the um, the, the 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 damn it embassy OS? Um, like, uh, or is it the, the concept of freedom itself? I mean, I think the concept of freedom itself, I think um, Larkin's movie that's coming out here soon is going to be a huge um, boon for in, in regards to that. So maybe if there's some way to work with Larkin, like doing um, advertising or um, what's called um, sponsorship, sponsoring the, uh, the release parties, stuff like that. Because um, I'm pretty sure that's going to get released to mainstream uh, content places. Not just you know the alternate. Now, those are all good tools, but if I mean, I think what Trent was saying, what I'm saying here is that that if you've got to have at least some some uh, concept of what that product is going to be that you can present, you don't want to promise something you can't deliver. You you don't want to make it too uh, esoteric and too uh, non-defined to where they don't know what you're offering. So you've got to have some tangible thing that you can put in front of them that they feel that are meeting their needs, and the needs are broad. So what, what do we focus on? You know, that's the key is getting our, get our game plan of what, what, what use cases we're trying, what problems are we trying to solve specifically? Then once we've got those problems identified specifically, then we can identify the audience. Once we have the audience, then we can go to the marketing to, to get in contact with those, with those uh, audience. Have any of you guys gotten in contact with uh, Corbett for his Solutions Watch. I'm going to be on Solutions Watch next Monday. Awesome. There we go. Boom. All right. Uh, just on the marketing uh, thing, um, what, what is what is what is the intent behind the marketing? Like, what what are you trying to get out of the marketing? Are you selling units or are you trying to find funding? I would say the, the, a good part of that marketing is to uh, is to be able to empower people to communicate and, and to, to thwart the tyranny that's coming down the pike. So that we're going to try and use technology to achieve that. So we want to reach people that have a that understand the problem of what's interfering with their freedom and try and bridge that gap by using technology. That's how I would phrase it. Who wants to go out? Okay, um, but. <laughs> that uh, that sounds like a pretty hard thing to market. Uh, you, marketing, exactly. marketing a philosophy. Exactly. I think I think marketing is is targeting more somebody who has a philosophy. I know, like, yes, that comes to my philosophy. Well, I, I guess what I'm going at is like, is the current problem as far as as marketing, uh, or what is the objective of the marketing? Uh, is it to buy? The, uh, the 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 server, or is it to find funding to be able to fund the server? Like what what, what like where where are you going with it? 
And, and the reason why I'm asking, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna, I think I'm leading, I'm using a leading question here. The reason why I'm asking is, is, uh, is because, uh, is, is, is there an interest in creating pre-sales? Like we don't know what the product looks like, but this is what we're promising, and this is what we're trying to attempt to get to, and we just need time to be able to do it. And here's a pre-sale of the product. You get into some problems with pre-sales legally. That's one issue that comes up right off the bat because when you promise something that you're going to deliver, you've got to you've got to structure that in a, in the right way that you're not going to get in trouble with the Securities Exchange Commission and other things. So and then and then you got to set expectations properly. And so how do you do that with a future thing in mind? And that's that's where I think I'm focused is how to set the proper expectations of what's going to be the deliverable. Okay. Uh, the the story that comes to mind is just the, the way Tesla was done. I think a uh, Tesla car was sold three times before uh, the client actually received the car. So like, uh, uh, I think it was Elon who went back to the uh, investors and was like, okay, and now well, I need another hundred thousand dollars for that car. If you want it, that's uh, that's what it's going to cost you. That, that's the story I heard. That's the rumor or the, the, the urban legend behind it. I don't know, actually, exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's why he has a thousand lawsuits against Tesla right now. <laughs> <laughs> and how many unhappy customers because of that, that process that, that you're describing? Okay. It, you know, right. guys, as far as target audiences, one thing that I, again, it's a blessing. Uh, Content Safe, which is more a commercial service, uh, has allowed me to get connected across a wide range of communities and we're focused primarily on content creators and what i can see from talking to these people i'm talking i got light star people who say that they're the children of aliens and i got people all the way over here that are like trump supporters and I, I even have some that are more left-leaning sort of leftist sort of people. And it, it's like all of these people recognize the need for the services we're talking about today. All of them. Because they're so, all feeling the, they're all feeling the you know, YouTube breathing down their backs or they just don't feel safe. That's one of the reasons that I think our partnership makes sense, uh, Matt, because uh, with a wide swath, I mean, it, it allows us to develop a product to meet those needs. We have a we have an audience that's broad enough, but it's fo fo publisher focused. So it's 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 a niche in that regard, but it's a broad niche in terms of the constituency of it. But it allows us to take the time to develop and refine what they need, and then from there we can branch out as 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 we identify other audiences. But it's a good it's a good starting place to address the marketing. Right, right. So I I, I think. There's an audience out there. That's my point. And quantifying it, I know the marketing folk are going to want to be able to quantify it better. And that's the, I guess that's our next problem is quantifying. It's not really so much focused on individuals like the, the start nine box is more focused on individuals. I think this is more focused on a broader community of people that are specifically publishers, but then the publishers are going to want to have their clients, their, their subscribers, have something that they're they're talking to so i think that it will involve individuals down the road at some point hmm. yeah well i mean if i mention a uh, pirate box to a trump supporter and i and i don't call it pirate box because that's not the right language to use with someone from that community but you say i'm good i can i'm trying to provide you with a means of owning your own content and being able to distribute your material without people from being preventing you from publishing and th their lights go on they're like tell me more so uh, the next you know for us tom it's more like usability we can't hand them a product that they can't figure out uh anyway that's that's enough Okay, well, let Who's me bridge over to what Rayo was asking me earlier about describing the Pirate mm -hmm. Box. And that's exactly right, Matt. The Pirate Box is not really very usable. It was meant to be a prototype that people could build on. And, and you know, for a community like this, I think it could work. I mean, we could learn from it. We could grow on it. But uh, And, and I, I am going to use that as a starting place for where we're going with the next version. There's a lot of things I have learned from the producing of the Pirate Box. 
but it, it there's a lot of aspects to it that is that are not user friendly that need to be refined a lot more. So um, in terms of what it is, it's basically just an it's a it started off being a Raspberry Pi with a IPFS and IPFS companion on it. That was the basic premise of it two years ago, and that evolved to be a uh, away from the away from the Raspberry Pi uh, hardware to a more general thing that I call the Pyra Stick, which is what. Uh, I, I took a different operating system rather than it being the Raspberry Pi OS that run only on the Raspberry on the Raspberry Pi. Now it runs on MX Linux operating system, which is an x86 based system that is run on an SSD drive. That, so the whole thing a Pirate Stick is nothing more than a portable SSD drive with all the software on it. You plug it in and boot from it, and now that is your operating system. So it's similar to Tails. Tails when it first started was a an optical a disc that you would plug into your computer and boot from that, and you now had a Tor environment uh, that, that was all self-protected, and, and, and you could do communications over Tor with that. Well, this is very similar, only it's using IPFS as its central mode of communications. So in a nutshell, that's really what the Pirate Box is. How difficult is the implementation for the Pirate Box right now, if, like for a layman? It's not, like I say, it's really not geared for the layman. I mean... It's geared for more the the, the hobbyist or technologist that, that I mean some it just depends on who the hob or who the who the layman is. I mean some laymen are more experienced than others. It's not somebody that's grandma is it's not grandma's just play. It's it's, very, well, very, somebody who's dedicated and wants to figure it out, figure be able to figure it out. I like think if, so. if, they, if they don't have like if I don't I've 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 programmed like a couple of things like an RSAM or um, dial code tables to to run a telephone system. For the Marine Corps, uh, that's about the extent of my programming. You know what I mean? Um, I understand really high root and log login and all that stuff, but it when doesn't it comes really to programming. There's no programming required, but but because of the concepts involved, it does require some learning curve to even understand what you're trying to accomplish with the software. I mean, even IPFS requires to understand what what the context is that IPFS is all about. And that's, right. that's, that's like that's an opportunity for another piece of marketing where it's a video series on a how-to. Absolutely. No doubt and, about and let me tell you what, you nailed it right on the head that when specifically IPFS technology, every trade magazine article is sucks. They're all terrible. They don't really explain what it is. And you're right. I think that is the next step. So then the next step in figuring that out is set up a time, uh, an organization for an organizational meeting schedule. You know, we got to ske schedule another assembly to uh, figure out how to do it. Yeah. Let me ask this update. Idea, to develop, to develop a, a development session for this video series. That That's sounds like an excellent yeah. next step. Uh, let me ask a question of uh, of Dave of Start Nine. Um, you you've incorporated the IPFS companion, which is what I really relied on heavily with the, with the Pirate Box. Um, is it's is it's kind of core user interface. Now I've added things to it that are even friendlier than the, than the IPFS companion. But in terms of the Start Nine Labs marketing, how are you? Uh, you know, you 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 incorporated IPFS into your Start Nine product for to reach some. I didn't. I assume you did that for to please some customer's demand for it. You didn't just do it and say, well, let's hope somebody wants it. I presume you have customers that wanted it, but what what is the uh, what is the user experience like using the IPFS companion? I mean, because I find the IPFS companion, it's better than just command line for sure, but it's still pretty clunky. It requires a lot of understanding of the IPFS infrastructure. It's not really ultimately very drag and drop, uh, drop box type of friendly that you would think a file system might be. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, you know, we have the same issue of if the so we get all kinds of different users that come in. Some people they just want a password manager, and that's all they want, and they're perfectly happy to be able to get off of uh, whatever hosted password manager they want. That's the only service they want to run. Um, and you know, when the when you set this device up, or if you purchase it from us, it comes with nothing but the operating system, unlike uh, you know uh, Windows or um, or some of these Android phones these days, it doesn't come with 1,600 things that you don't want that you have to go through some advanced guide to figure out how to uninstall, which seems to be getting no worse. No bloatware, eh? Yeah, the bloatware, it's, it's a problem. Um, so it comes with nothing on the service side, and then you go to the marketplace, as you would be used to uh, using an app store on a phone, and you select what you'd want. So let's say uh, that a user was interested 
uh, already in IPFS. They know something about it. They know that they want to pin some content or uh, help to uh, do some archival work or something like that. Well, then they would go install that service. Um, and the, the first step is always to configure that service. And this is all done with UI elements. Um, typically, uh, or many services won't really have much of a config. Uh, and whatever that config is, uh, will always have sensible defaults that were chosen by the package developer. Um, and you can always just uh, leave the defaults as they are, click save and start the service. Um, and then the next thing that we encourage people to do, and again, it's an encouragement that many people ignore, and some of these are techies, and in fact, sometimes the techies are the worst offenders, is to read the instructions that are included with every single service. Uh, and those instructions often include video links, documentation, additional guides, integration guides for things like uh, browser extensions and client applications. Um, so we encourage folks to, to do that, and we try and keep that you know, kind of minimal, very basic setup. Um, IPFS is this, it does this, and here are the basic steps for setup. Um, and if you follow that happy path, you will be able to do whatever basic um, you know, uh, operations that service is designed to do. So for example, in the case of IPFS, we might say, um, you know, go to your browser of choice, download the IPFS companion application or extension, um, and enter your addresses from here into here, uh, and then, you know, click connect, so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, again, the approach we take is to do an MVP, a minimum viable product. So. For example, IPFS is just very basic. It's essentially the uh, reference implementation uh, linked with the companion such that you can fire up the web UI and have a nice graphical interface uh, and then upload your files or pin other people's content, um, things like that. Um, and then we will kind of continue to add, um, you know, other, you know, so uh, for example, we have uh, an API for what we call actions for any particular service. And that might be something like a reset password action that you can run from your embassy um, or uh, you know, things of that nature. So we can add more advanced, um, you basically scripts and API or excuse me, CLI um, actions that otherwise the user would have to learn a great deal how to do. We can turn that into a button click, but there is no getting past as far as I can tell the, uh, the learning curve of like, why, why do I want this thing uh, what am I going to use it for? And then, you know, how does it work in a very general sense? We'd make it as easy as possible. But at the end of the day, someone has to have a motivation to actually use these services. And sometimes that's because they're having their content censored uh, or because they are you know, no longer trusting some third party and they want to start taking responsibility for something themselves. Uh, but there has to be some motivation there. And that is definitely an unsolved problem. And, um, you know, like I said, education is one of our biggest uh, exports, as it were. Have you taken any metrics on how many customers have downloaded the IPFS uh, uh, module that you've created? Um, I don't know what that metric would be. Uh, that is one of the only things that we can tell about our system is how many times a service has been downloaded. Um, and that's actually a metric which will become less and less um, accurate as uh, the marketplace that we run uh, we don't intend to be the only one. We have an, uh, a system, an open system such that anyone can host their own services. And so if Start9 is banned by the FBI or our offices catch fire or something like that, uh, then other marketplaces can still serve um, all this software. Right. So similar to what we're used to in the Linux world with different repositories. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, would, I would say that IPFS is not a very popular service in comparison to something like Nextcloud, Vault Warden, Bitcoin lightning, things like that. But, um, you know, the fact that we have it there and we can continually improve it. Uh, and I do get a little bit of feedback from some people that are using it. So uh, we'll continue to improve it. But, uh, but yeah, I don't have a solid metric on that for you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. For Dave, does Start9 have a budget for, for, for creating a video series or um, would you guys have to raise capital for that? So our approach to, um, so we basically spent the last three years sort of heads down engineering, um, making sure that we have something foundational. Uh, and then, you know, when I came on a couple of years ago, uh, 
one of the first things that I started doing was producing some basic instructional videos. And to be honest, they're pretty bad, <laughs> but they were better than the nothing that we had at the time. Uh, and now we are now moving towards uh, where we have, we actually have a, a marketing site for, uh, for about two and a half years. We just had a documentation website. We didn't do any kind of um, marketing whatsoever. Uh, we do go out to uh, conferences and things like that. We now produce some, you know, semi-marketing material. We have a guy that's a little better at uh, video production than myself. Um, and we do some contract work, for example, or have some contractors for stuff like the website. And uh, we did some promotion of our uh, latest hardware product um, using a really snazzy looking video. Uh, so we are kind of dipping our toes for the first time into that marketing world um, because we now feel like we're ready that we have this, um, you know, this foundation upon which we can build that we don't have to, uh, you know, we've never done any kind of um, you know, cr uh, crowdfund or something for something that didn't exist. So uh, we did do some pre-orders. We wouldn't call them pre-sales. We did some pre-orders for the latest device. Um, once we knew and had paid for um, the, uh, the equipment to show up. So um, we still had some trouble, you know, meeting the deadline, but uh, we, we, we did get it just in time and we want to make sure and we uh, are able to keep our promises. So that's very important to us. I may be throwing him under the bus with this comment, but Stefano is going to be developing a, or has the plans to develop a course on video editing for the autonomy community. And something like this would be a great um, project for that to focus on. I don't know. What do you think about that stuff? Uh, something like how, like how to series being the, the focus of that course, like the, uh, the actual content that the students could, um, download and play with or stuff, something along those lines? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not seeing the same vision you're, 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 you're describing. What, what would be the content? The, this, this how-to video series on um, installing like the Pirate Box or Start9. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, I suppose <laughs> it's a little less sexy uh, as far as uh, as uh, I'm. We're probably going to have to talk about this. Like, I'm, I'm not. I'm not seeing it the way you're seeing it, maybe, because uh, uh, I, I was more seeing like students uh, cutting together like uh, uh, cowboy shooting scenes and stuff like that. But uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, no, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's another like it's a type maybe, maybe, of video, you know what I mean? Like um, as far as like different styles of videos, you know, there's some some there's some videos that are out there that are, um, you know, um, beauty videos. Some are this is like a how to on tech or some videos are for entertainment purposes. Um, some are knowledge based. Um, yeah. I don't know. That was just a thought that came that it just seemed like a, a married like a marriage ma made in like a little kismet whatever um that you were starting that and then hey we need this video made so i don't know i'm just throwing no, I, stuff against the wall seeing what sticks i i, I see it uh, I, I definitely see where you're going with that we're gonna have to talk about it uh, I'm, I'm just i'm just not seeing your vision so uh, possibly that, that might happen Awesome. Awesome, guys. That was uh, all very valuable stuff. Very valuable stuff. Um, I suppose uh, there is uh, Josiah is here and uh, do have some, I guess, some Bitcoin stuff to get to. Uh, I guess Alex is here too, Tucson Bitcoin. Um, so um, I guess uh, are there any other, I guess, anything else on Start9 or I guess marketing, uh, you know, or I guess uh, kind of, uh, you know, actually getting this stuff out there? Um, I guess uh, any, any other thoughts on that before we change gears a little bit? Okay. I guess I can I'll wrap up and say that I, I just posted my uh, one of my scuttlebutt IDs there on the chat, on the on the forum here, and and uh, I, I set up a room in Iceland, a, a scuttlebutt room that we can rendezvous in to find other people. So that's something I'll just throw out there for anybody to join. If you if you want to get together and talk amongst the people in this group, um, <clears throat> you have to establish a, a name for that for that. I mean, right now everybody's just known by a cryptic, you know, hash. But you can associate a name with it, and once you get your Maniverse installed, then you can, you can refer to each each person by the name. Yeah, yeah, and I would certainly yeah, and yeah, it's really recommend everyone having check out difficulty Scuttlebutt. finding Maniverse. Oh, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, anyone having difficulty finding Maniverse, uh, they 
they have a weird domain name. It's Manny Ver at V E R dot S E, uh, rather than the whole name of the app. I put it in chat. Sorry, gotcha. sorry, Rayo. Oh no, that's that's all good. It's all good. I was just gonna jump jump on that and say that. Um, yeah, I, I definitely recommend uh, people check out uh, Scuttlebutt in general, but Manyverse is, I guess, a, a pretty, a pretty, pretty decent application at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, so Thomas put his uh, Scuttlebutt ID in there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dig out the uh, the ghost tablet and pull mine out too at some point and post it in the Signal or Telegram chats. Um, and uh, I guess yeah, let's uh, let's get connected on there and start testing that out because it's a really good protocol. So. Um, all right, Josiah, are you with us, brother? I'm here. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? I switched to the phone, so I don't know if, if that's better or worse. But <laughs> um, Audio's coming through all right. Um, yeah, so... Okay, cool. Yeah, so I just want to give everyone an update on the Tasmania General Bitcoin Fund. Um, and for those of you that, that aren't familiar with it, it is... Uh, like I saw your uh, update on the website, Rayo, so that looks really good. Like it's got the QRs and everything on it. Um, but basically what I started it for was as a more of like a mutual aid fund uh, for those within the Pasnia community. Um, and then also just for other uh, general causes as well. So um I think uh, it's been it's been going pretty well. Um, I think uh, a couple of the things most recently, actually, like I know, uh, it looks like Sec was on, Sec Magora was on here for mm -hmm. a little bit, but I think he. Uh, but uh, we actually were able to provide him with with uh, about a hundred dollars for like his to go towards his uh, work fixing his work truck. Um, that was one thing that, uh, you know, that, that was definitely, um, something that we could help, help with. Um, and then, uh, as, as far as some of the other causes, like, um, uh, Roots Pasnia is another, is like another, uh, I guess, node, if you will, of, uh, of Pasnia, um, located in New York. So we were able to actually help, help this guy out, uh, do um you know basically start his uh homestead and uh another you know, basically another node of uh Pasnia, um with some financial help from the bitcoin general fund um so like i guess uh the other thing is like how to do, how does it work um basically we accept donations from uh you know just from that using a qr code or um i know uh the Pasnia General Fund's now located in Samurai, or um, you know, we've we've been able to migrate the wallets to Samurai. Um, so we have uh, a PayNim over there. That's also, um, if you want to check it out on the Pasnia website as well, too. Um, and it is on the, uh, the on the screen, uh, for, on, screen the, on the screen for the viewers too. The uh, the Pasnia, um, just the General Fund QR code and the PayNim QR code. Um, so people can just go ahead and scan, make your donation to the uh, Pasnia. Um, Bitcoin general fund. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, th I think uh, just that the idea kind of took off um, just kind of um, like shortly after, after Pasnia was founded, I think after we, you know, after we had that first, um, I guess uh, the founders meeting <laughs> um, and it was, you know, basically, you know, we, we needed uh, sort of like a general mutual aid fund to where uh, if somebody did need help, just kind of little, little hand up or something like that. Not necessarily like for a, um, not necessarily to create sort of a welfare system or whatever, but, but just if somebody um, was in, in a dire need of financially, you know, in the community that we could at least help that, that person out. Um, and so it's, it's been going going well. Um, another thing that's uh, kind of popped up as an idea really um, has been the uh, like the bounty system. Um, we basically created uh, a page on the on the float platform, which is like a social media type of a thing. Um, 
maybe a little less well known than like a uh, Mastodon or or Twitter or something like that. But like Float, um, we were able to just kind of make a page and then uh, use it to uh, post um, different projects. I think um, to to sort of incentivize. Uh, activities that we want to see as like voluntarists. Um, we want to see, uh, you know, people taking action. Um, so uh, in order to, to do that, we also, um, you know, have incentivized that through the, the Pasnia General Fund. Um, I know uh, most recently, like there's, there's an aquaponics project up there, which I believe is already claimed by uh, one of our our members, um, and so basically, the fund would pay pay you a certain amount of money, or pay you like a bounty to to um, complete these types of projects. Um, another one is like, for example, like uh, uh, improving um, a van, like van improvements or like van conversions, something like that. If, if somebody uh, was thinking about taking a, a nomadic lifestyle um, or, you know, basically hitting the road, uh, we could obviously help them um, with that. Now, I guess uh, the the fund is still pretty small. So like the current balance is, is like 0 0.02 Bitcoin um, right now. So it's still basically in, it, in its infancy, so we still need, you know, donations from the community to, to kind of make this uh, make this idea grow. Um, I think uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, another thing is uh, um, yeah, and then as far as like causes that are have been. Um, I guess not related to the community. Um, the Bitcoin General Fund, like when it first started, was able to donate a small amount to a whistleblower uh, legal defense fund, um, which has helped, I guess, helped uh, Daniel Hale, um, although he still is uh, serving, he is now serving a pr prison sentence. Um, but the Bitcoin general fund was able to at least contribute a little bit to that, um, which is kind of a, an interesting cause. And you could, you could find uh, this information um, on the float float page. And it's under um, actually under my username, Josiah Warren. Um, that's kind of just been reclaimed as a, basically the total has general fund. Um, if you go to Josiah Warren on, on the float page, you'll, that'll just, route you right to the to the uh general fund page so awesome awesome well thank you for that update josiah and obviously thank you for taking the initiative to set that up it's, it's helped a number of people so far and it's going to help more in the future so um so we what we got to do um it's definitely one one part of the, the human experience is helping each other out so um yeah thanks again for uh, for your efforts um on that one uh is there anything else you wanted to, to share or talk about we, we'll uh while we're here and we, we got you Um, no, just, I mean, other than just like that migration to Samurai, it's been working out very, really well. Like when we receive donations, um, we'll obviously just like kick them over to the Whirlpool and uh, remix it. So if there's any concern about, you know, um, I guess like receiving a donation that is, is like KYC Bitcoin or something like that, like that's been eliminated. Um, and so you know, it's, it's coming right from a, like a really clean, like not non shit coin, Bitcoin <laughs> type of thing. Mm -hmm. thing. So, um, right. Right. Yeah. That's Whirlpool's about great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for that. Just, I guess we can, we can keep rolling with the, uh, the Bitcoin topics. Um, Alex Dishinger, uh, Tucson Bitcoin is here. He wrote a, he contributed an article to, um, the Vanu podcast. That's, uh, available I, I don't remember the short link but i'll have i'll have it up here on screen and i'll put it in the show notes um but uh he, he put forth uh you know i guess uh open my eyes to some possibilities that i hadn't thought of before and um i guess uh just maybe some considerations you hadn't thought of um in the realm of uh you know peer-to-peer peer-to-peer -peer, peer uh, bitcoin uh, infrastructure um uh, you know home mining and uh things of that nature so uh 
that said, Alex, uh, welcome, uh, welcome to the assembly. How's it going? Oh, it's going. It's going. It's going good. good to hear. <laughs> it's pretty cool to be a fly on the wall for this conversation. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get you, didn't get to uh, introduce you before now. But uh, um, anyway, I guess um, it has been a number of months um, since you uh, you published this. But um, I guess uh, for you, for you wrote this. But I guess could you I guess give us uh, an idea of what what you you I guess what some of the things you I guess you you covered there. Um, uh, in terms of you know um, agorist Bitcoin mining and how um, how it can you know be a be of assistance to like an overall you know passing a Bitcoin mining network per se. Yeah, um, I so I've had a interesting journey in Bitcoin. So I kind of stumbled into Bitcoin mining. Uh, I just for reference, I sell Bitcoin mining hardware, and that's my you know, day job. And then I do, you know, some mining on the side myself. Uh, but I, you know, have been able to watch a lot of different, uh, customers implement, uh, mining differently in very creative ways. And it's been awesome to watch. Um, but essentially like, I, I think Bitcoin mining is very interesting, uh, because you're essentially buying Bitcoin from the network and the cost is, uh, electricity. Um, and so you're, instead of going through all these, you know, typical services, which are, you know, permissioned and uh, don't treat your data uh, very well. You just bypass that completely, um, you know, with the cost of electricity, you know, being the biggest cost. And then also, you know, there's execution risk uh, um, involved, uh, but you get, you know, Bitcoin that way um, from the network, which I think is pretty cool. And, uh, you know, interesting. So I think um, there's a few interesting, or really like, man, I'm tired today. There's a few uh, ways to go about this that I think are uh, pretty cool from an agorist perspective. You know, one is, you know, it's an easy way to generate income um, without it, you know, being easily monitored, I guess, is is a good way to put it. Um, you can do that by running the machines yourself or, uh, running the machines for other people and having them pay you, uh, to do that. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. And then, you know, there's also the aspect of, um, it's a way to potentially fund energy infrastructure. Uh, I think that's a, you know, a big one that's important to talk about going forward in the future, uh, because, uh, our energy, um, infrastructure, you know, globally is just atrocious right now. And I think looking for alternative ways to generate electricity, to run your life, uh, is a very, very, you know, interesting, uh, topic and mining can accelerate that and make it make more sense. Um, because you have immediate income, uh, attached to, you know, deploying that infrastructure, uh, versus just um, uh, generating power for yourself or selling it to somebody else. Uh, so yeah, that that kind of encompasses you know some of the topics that I talked about in that article I wrote for. Yeah, yeah, and um, the just the I guess the privacy friendliness of mining over you know getting your Bitcoin from mining versus yeah buying from a KYC exchange. Gosh, don't do that. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a huge advantage for sure. That's a huge advantage for sure. Um, or even bought just buying from miners directly. If you, if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to mine, it's a good way to, to acquire Bitcoin. Um, so I guess there was, there was one, um, and you want to, I guess a little bigger, a uh, little bigger on this, but, um, I guess, uh, could you, could you speak and yeah, and we talked about this when I had you on, on uh, the Vani podcast too, but, um, could you talk, I guess, go a little more into, I guess, the relevancy between, you know, energy and Bitcoin, um, and power, I guess power generation, because like I said, we talked about it a little bit, but, um, I, I, I don't think people can sit, you know, really go that far in their consideration. So if you, if you could cover that and maybe also how that could play into, you know, maybe bigger infrastructure, um, different, I guess, different ideas in that area, in that direction. Yeah. Um, oh, it, it's a big topic to dive into. Uh, you know, one, one thing I, re I really like about home mining and small scale mining in particular is that it, uh, allows people to have skin in the game to begin to understand electricity uh, because you'll, you know, 
the majority of people don't really have any incentives to go and uh, become hobbyist electricians until they buy a miner that only runs on 240 volts uh, and you know you'll have to figure out how to make that work in your house which you know is not typically an ideal situation uh, and it requires some you know adjustments of your like electrical home infrastructure um so the, on, on a very like small level um that's interesting and then people begin to you know look at their electric bill and at the utility differently uh, when it's attached to uh you know a potential profit and you know when somebody you know looks at their their power bill and they're like you know it doesn't really make sense for me to be mining like this is garbage why is my utility charging me so much and then you know they learn about the politics of that um of how electricity prices are set and you know just the way the grid works um it's pretty interesting but you know from a you know security level uh bitcoin's energy usage is pretty incredible um i i read an article somewhere and i i don't remember you know the amount but you you hear the headlines uh you know pretty frequently that bitcoin uses more electricity than entire countries um and that is you know, a very, very beautiful thing and something that, you know, I think we want because that shows, um, you know, how difficult it would be to, you know, attack the network, at, at least from a, you know, mining perspective. Um, uh, it forces uh, the network to be decentralized, you know, because you can't just, you know, set up, um, like say, you know, example for the US government, if they wanted to attack the network, um, you know, using mining uh, to, you know, reorder transactions or, or whatever, the amount of electricity that they would have to produce, um, you know, is astronomical. They couldn't just set that up in one, you know, city or, or one spot. Um, it would have to be distributed across the entire U.S. And then there's massive, um, uh, you know, hardware restrictions, you know, to, to go and, you know, source the hardware, um, you know, it would be very, very difficult to do that. Uh, not only from, you know, the actual Bitcoin miner itself, but the electrical infrastructure, the transformers, you know, the, the wiring, the cables, just stuff to set up that mine. And then, um, you know, to find qualified individuals to, to actually, you know, manage that for them, you know, is, is, almost impossible because there's almost nobody qualified um this entire industry is just people kind of making it up as we go and you know trying to sort things together through um uh you know trial and error and inventing things for the most part um so that that's one cool side of it um I, i'm not sure if i'm really answering your question well, that, was, um, that, that was good and i was, I was gonna i was gonna jump in right there because that was um i, I post there was one clip i posted like four years four or five years ago and it was one that one from uh one of andreas Anto antonopoulos's presentations he was talking about like if that were to happen like if a government if a government did actually even if even if it was possible even if they so if, even if they did um the best the best they could do is one double spend and then it would be found out and we'd route around it and all that asic hardware would be basically worthless at that point so it'd be like uh um it would it would yeah it's 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 not feasible as far as i as far as i understand it um but anyway um it's it's yeah. very mm -hmm. difficult yeah yep yep gotcha so i guess um uh, I guess more of a practical question here. Um, so, uh, so, so mining, obviously the, 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 I guess the no KYC benefits are good. Um, but, uh, I guess there are people now that are using their Bitcoin miners, um, you know, to heat their house. Some people are heating hot tubs with them. Um, people are do you know, so like, um, <clears throat> you know, like getting paid Bitcoin to sit in your hot tub, that's kind of crazy. Um, and then getting into bigger, you know, bigger, you know, bigger ideas too. Like if we, if, you know, there's a distributed network of passing a Bitcoin miners, um, and, uh, you know, um, you know, have our own, I guess our, our own mining network. So, um, I guess, uh, if you want to talk a little bit about the unique uses of Bitcoin and at a personal level, and then, uh, I guess maybe how the, you know, the, 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 I guess an actual Bitcoin mine could look and, and, and come, I guess just your thoughts on that overall. Um, sure. Um, so I think, you know, there's definitely some pretty interesting applications when it comes to the Pasnian network. I think one of the big ones is like, I, I mine at home. Um, I don't have, you know, a ton of miners because my electric bill, you know, is very, uh, poor. Um, I pay about 13 cents a kilowatt hour. And so, you know, on average, like a good rate, 
is probably for mining is probably about you know six cents um that's ideally what you want to be paying or or below well below that uh, the lower the better um i'm also um capped at a certain amount of electricity that i can consume at my home um without you know doing a bunch of expensive upgrades and you know i personally don't own my home so it doesn't really make sense for me to do that even though the landlord is you know okay with it um so you know hosting becomes an interesting discussion for me you know and hosting you know has a really bad name right now because you know mining is very difficult to um actually implement uh, successfully and a very good portion of the people that go out and try to do it you know fail in the process um you know for a variety of reasons the biggest one is just the economics are brutal uh but you know say there's an individual in the Pasnian network that has you know favorable electricity costs at their home and they can you know run um 10 kilowatts of miners you know for example so that, that's about three miners you know i could potentially you know send them a miner uh and pay them um to run it you know at their home essentially um so that that's kind of an interesting w way to think about it you know there's also uh generally businesses have lower electric rates so if you're a commercial um commercially zoned or you're industrial industrial blah, industrially zoned you're going to have a lower electricity rate than residential um and i think small businesses or just businesses in general that already have infrastructure it's an awesome way to you know generate more revenue um and provide a decent service so you know say for example i have a customer who has a friend that runs a candy factory in the south and they get charged about four cents a kilowatt hour um so he hosts uh his machines with that guy you know and the way that they have the arrangement mm -hmm. is like every 10 machines that uh this guy buys he buys uh the candy shop one machine and that's kind of the way that he handles or it might be the x amount of time so that's the way that he handles uh hosting fees essentially and so he manages it for that company they get bitcoin revenue um it's a pretty you know sweet arrangement and to this company you know this big factory uh the power bills of this guy running his miners are kind of negligible um so they don't really care um and it's a you know added business expense for on on the books you know income um so it's you know kind of a favorable hack um so you know those are some like interesting implication or potential you know ways to apply this to the Paznian network uh that i think would be pretty cool um yeah um, yeah and i guess how, um, how realistic would it be to run um some of these miners off of solar because i've got 400 watts of solar panels and a charge controller here in chicago that i'm not using and if we can get them down to Pasnia veritas um, i think they would be much more appropriately used generating crypto like is that is that a possibility will 400 watts work not really um so i, I think solar is like um it, it's not good for mining because mining is so energy dense and it's a constant draw um so i mean you can use it to subsidize but i don't think it you know it's very economical to to go out and buy you know solar uh infrastructure you know to try and subsidize your miners it's it's so like you know this is an interesting you know use case um because you could ship it down to uh rayo and uh it could be used to subsidize um a little bit but you know your average miner today is dry drawing a constant 3.2 or 3.6 kilowatts and and it's only going up in energy density um which kind of renders solar, you know, just unfeasible. Um, like miners are very successful, uh, or miners that are successful go and exploit inefficiencies in the grid. And so like there are miners that, that benefit from subsidized solar prices or wind prices. Um, you know, a big one is hydro. Um, 
power uh, that's just you know kind of out there being uh you know squandered you know some government um funded uh set up um built a massive hydro dam in the middle of nowhere uh that with power that isn't being used that miners can go in um and get and i think you know that that's interesting you know and it has been a topic i've looked at a little bit is like you know what are ways that individuals can generate power um on their own um solar seems to be you know pretty disappointing um where it's at right now uh versus you know gasification or you know you building a little um water turbine on a river um you know various things like that and like i think solar is useful for like like there's something like you know a lot of people you know ask me about um and I, I think the challenge the first challenge is like how do you operate um your daily life on solar you know without any sort of um interruptions compared to grid power like that's that's the first challenge that you know we have to get to before um i which very minimal or very few people are able to do without you know exorbitant investments uh that just don't make economical sense um so yeah is there any amount of solar that that would be feasible like if somebody had a huge like two thousand three thousand watt like I don't know how much that that um you said you needed what six kilowatts an hour uh, about for one machine probably about 3.2 kilowatts um that's a lot <laughs> right. it, it, it's a tremendous amount it's 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 very very energy dense um which is pretty cool and and the miners are becoming more energy dense which i think is so also all we need cool. to do is install um, 400 watts of solar or 400 100 watt solar panels over at uh at veritas and we're good <laughs> so one idea that's terrible one Holy idea crap. to come at this from is this idea of do you have a use for waste heat so if you have for example a chicken coop that needs heat in the winter you could get an old miner for like 120 bucks uh you can ratchet it down to 300 watts and you can heat that thing all day <clears throat> the biggest problem with solar tends to come at night uh, Obviously. Yeah, that's interesting. But um, as far as like um, like commercial mining and, and trying to make uh, serious profits with, with mining, uh, solar is definitely not the way. But if you're thinking about it, you know, from a perspective of I already have some power because I invested in these panels or whatever, um, and you have some use for heat. Um, maybe you want to heat water, for example. That's or another great example that uh, guys are hacking together their water. Or maybe water a sprinter van. To, um, yeah, uh, that's you know maybe mobile is a little bit more difficult. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, these are all things to kind of think about if you're if this is something that you want to hack around on at home and um, use it as a a project to uh, where you want to maybe not worry so much about profit, but to have that waste heat and get some KYC free Bitcoin. That's mm -hmm. maybe a better way to think about it on that scale. Yeah. I, I heat my home in the winter uh, with Bitcoin miners and it's fantastic. <laughs> um, like, a, you know, another example of that using the waste heat is I know I have a customer that owns a bowling alley and he eats the bowling alley with Bitcoin miners. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's totally doable. I, I definitely like, I, I think the applications in the future of using it to heat wat miners to heat water are going to be very interesting. Uh, based on what I've seen right now, it's just, it's a massive headache, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, just because um, the, the manufacturers don't like to, you know, work with our creativity. They build the machines a certain way. Um, and I can go deep into that topic. Um, um, but it, it's, it's going to be a thing in the future. I think it's very, very promising, but if you set out with the goal of doing that right now, you're probably going to, um, deal with a lot of pain and spend a lot of money, uh, tinkering. So, um, awesome. Yeah. It's all, yeah, that's all really valuable stuff. It's all really valuable stuff. Um, 
Let me see. I guess the the only thing that came to mind when you were when you were talking was, um, and I guess one of the thing that I that came to mind with the Pasnia Bitcoin mining network is, um, you know, trusted Bitcoin nodes versus you know just connecting to a, a random node. And I guess if we had a distributed uh, Bitcoin mining network, that would also probably give us you know so a selection of trusted nodes uh, to cho uh, to choose from. Because as we were talking about with mining, um, some no some nomads can't you know you know run, uh, host or run their own Bitcoin node or whatever. So um, I think that's another another. Uh, another potential benefit and positive um, to maybe maybe strive for. Oh, and then I guess the the other note that I have here that I, I guess I forgot about um, from uh, from a few months back was um, and I don't know how this would work out yet, but um, you know as another you know incentive for joining the Pasadena network maybe it's like a tier three stakeholder perk. Um, there's uh, you know may, maybe uh, maybe you get some KYC, KYC free satoshis each month or something like that. Um, you know from the mining network. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, again, I'm not sure how logistically this will all work out, but um, go ahead. Well, well, how, how well could Simbit? Does anyone have an opinion on Bitcoin Lightning and how that could like allow for microtransactions, maybe in mining? Um, yeah, I mean, there there's some attempts to uh, integrate Lightning into mining, and it, it's just not been uh super adopted you know and i think part of the reason is is because the majority of the market is large-scale miners or medium-scale miners that are dealing in amounts that it doesn't make sense to mm -hmm. um, use lightning but i mean you very well could withdraw the, the funds from a mining pool um you know move it over onto lightning and then do payouts uh to people that way and that might be you know a pretty good way to go about it um so I mean, I mean, I, I think you know, Lightning has a lot of promise with with micropayments, and you know, it has a lot of really cool applications right now um, that you can begin to be using. I, I I use it pretty frequently, just passing funds, you know, to content creators or you know, to friends um, back and forth, and then from like a standpoint of like just you know, small transactions. So like, you know, say somebody brings something to a Bitcoin meetup that I want to buy. You know, I, I generally have a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin on my lightning wallet, you know, to do a transaction right there. Um, because just it's easier than, than all. you will buy, uh, you know, in this specific, you know, instance, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, infrastructure pertaining to mining um that overlaps with lightning not yet not yet <laughs> cool i know we've been uh with our project with trent we've talked about uh integrating lightning payments hold on ah sorry video playing in my ear uh yeah we've talked about uh integrating lightning payments into kickstart for time later yeah i mean i think like for the for the pasnia like general fund that that'd be a really interesting thing to explore um because individuals would be able to um you know donate very small amounts um and maybe not feel the pressure of like oh i i have to do a you know a larger transaction um you know there's other things like i'm not sure if you looked into um Rayo, but uh, you can like set up your podcast uh, so that listeners can send you small amounts of Bitcoin uh, while they're listening. You know, so say mm -hmm. I, I like set up like mm -hmm. I'm going to send you ten satoshis per you know minute that I listen. Um, there, there's a lot of really cool uh, uh, economic like agorist you know, standpoint is that it's so infinitely superior and and has so much less friction than the, the fiat monetary system and, and just any alternative. But the velocity that we can transact, um, it's going to, you know, really permeate um, all these different economies, especially like as we're looking at um, more friction being added to the fiat monetary system and a targeting, uh, dissident groups and you know targeting individuals that you know are are minorities and don't benefit from the fiat system so 
Yeah. 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 I, I definitely would. Uh, I, I would definitely like to talk more with you about mining in, in another venue. The, this, uh, what you're doing really sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the um, I'm glad you brought up the I guess the podcasting aspect of that too. Yeah, the paying you know s um, certain amount of satoshis per minute or whatever. Um, and I do plan on getting on um, Lightning as another one of those. Um, I gotta get I gotta get a full node set up. Um, and maybe that'll correspond with uh, you know mining at the distillery with super cheap, um, super cheap energy. But I don't know. It's, that's that's a project for maybe a year year down the road or whatever. I'm not ready to tackle that yet. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to to. But I guess the getting access, getting a lightning node to to connect to to um, do that wouldn't be too difficult either. And uh, I guess I do use um, voltage for BTC pay server right now. So I guess I could expand out um, for expand out further too. So. Yeah, there are options. Well, see, that's where Start Nine is got going to provide you with a lightning node, right? Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Dave, you yeah. Provide lightning nodes yet? Yeah, we do have the whole stack, and it, what's nice is you know we have a dependency management system so that the user doesn't really have to fully understand the stack that they're working with. But so, for example, if you wanted to run uh, as a business, you said, or if you wanted to run a, a Kickstarter or something like that, and you said, I want to run BTC Pay Server. You go to the, the marketplace, you'd install that, and it would tell you, oh, uh, you need Bitcoin uh, in order to run this. So here's the link to install that. Mm. And then if you choose to optionally, um, if you want to take Lightning payments or uh, use it as a Lightning wallet, you will optionally want to install an implementation of that. And we have uh, LND and CLN um, available right now, which you can run simultaneously as well, which is nice for uh, playing around experimentation uh, and learning how the network works, as well as deciding, you know, maybe which of those implementations might work best for you. Cool. Uh, educate me a little bit about the Lightning Network with regard to tra traceability and tracking. If, if we set up a, our private, if we set up a, a, a separate link for, for a Lightning Network, is that something that's easily traceable or only if you only if you're operating the node that the, the transactions are going through. So uh, the most private situation that you can create with Lightning is if you have two users that run a node and they open a private channel, that channel is not really, uh, it, it's not um, advertised to the network. And so, uh, and then you can have between you uh, the equivalent of a bar tab uh, where you're passing funds back and forth. Um, and so that would be kind of the most private way to use uh, to use a lightning channel and uh, over Tor, of course. Um, if you are using a large, if you are, say, like uh, if Pasnia had its own bit, uh, lightning node, uh, it would make more sense for that to be public. Uh, and, you know, while, you know, tracing the routes of payments is a little bit difficult because the uh, that is originated and created by the, um, uh, by the sender, um, that is still going to be somewhat more public. It's definitely more private than a, a on-chain transaction. Uh, there are a lot of privacy benefits to Lightning, uh, but it's not uh, the number one uh, use case. Still kind of pseudo trend, uh, pseudo uh, secure. And, and I just read a paper the other day from some academics course. You know, take that for whatever you will. Uh, that they claim that uh, Lightning, it, as it scales, it gets less less secure as it scales and um like i say take that for whatever you will that may just be propaganda i mean i i think there's a lot of development like exciting development uh coming in on the lightning uh to make it more private and uh it definitely has its setbacks and challenges and i think on chain you know significantly easier to be private on right now um but well i do know yeah. that there's some significant money going into lightning mm -hmm. uh, i have an acquaintance that has done done some consulting with me that he's worked that's what he does every day is he works for a company that does lightning so and they said that even with the downturn in bitcoin that we're going to continue to fund for another year or two yeah I mean, so, it, going back to the 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 example that you just described dave the peer-to-peer -peer example is that truly peer-to-peer -peer where no no uh transactions have to be no information about the lightning uh, when you have two individuals set up with a lightning node and they're interchanging value between the two of them it doesn't have to be settled or go back to the uh, the main chain at all it's completely peer-to-peer -peer? so is that right 
uh, to to clarify, an on-chain transaction is required to open a, uh, a Lightning uh, channel, and so to that okay. extent, the answer is no. Um, gotcha. As far as like, like the now you can use uh, on-chain privacy tools like uh, coin mixers and things of that nature. Uh, one of which we just sure. added was uh, Jam, which is a front end for Join Market. Um, those are tools that you can use to obscure your on-chain transaction, uh, which you can then use to uh, create your channel with your with your peer. Um, but the the nodes, uh, Lightning nodes, are peers, um, and they you know while they uh, understand the Lightning network graph. Uh, they're not sort of required to announce everything that they do. Gotcha. Now, one last question I, I have with regard to the whole uh, Lightning and the fact that Start9 Labs has, has got a, a position in that as a company. <clears throat> um, as we see the pressures of uh, coming down to go cashless and the CDBC that's looming that's going to be happening at some point, we know that's going to re-roll out. Um, what, what do you project in the future with regard to Start9 Labs' position when the government finally comes out out and eventually says everything's counterfeit except for CDBCs. I mean, because we know that that's probably going to happen. So when that occurs, what's Start Nimes' position going to be? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, I'm not sure that we have a uh, a precise contingency for that, which I believe we should. It's a good conversation. I'm going to bring that up immediately. Um, but as far as our position uh, as a you know quote unquote Bitcoin company, um, it, it is. A, there's a couple of reasons that Bitcoin is a big part of what we do. The, the first reason is that people that use Bitcoin immediately understood what we were doing because they mm -hmm. want to run the node um, themselves such that they don't have to trust a third party node. So that, that was one reason is that, that we have so many Bitcoin tools is that that was the crowd that immediately understood what we were doing. Um, now, again, Bitcoin is not required in any any sense. If you choose uh, to run your own Embassy OS server, you do not have to install Bitcoin or Lightning. Um, and there are other projects um, working on adding their node pro uh, cryptocurrency nodes as well. Um, now, whether or not those will be in our official marketplace or you get it from their repository, um, we don't know yet. We're actually considering um, lowering the amount of services we support just because we're getting a little bit overwhelmed we're approaching i think 40 some services and it's a little bit untenable for us to provide support for all of them so we're probably going to pair that down to about 20 things like very well maintained uh, and then sure, the popular ones, trust in the, the ones that are in demand yeah absolutely and then trust in the community to uh step, step up or the upstream developers to step up and uh, help maintain those packages um uh, but yeah, as far as what would happen uh, from a company's perspective for, for Start9, if let's say we have a situation where um, there's kind of a, a popular theory forming about this idea that Bitcoin is in some way either regulated to death or uh, split in two, essentially, where you have sort of KYC Bitcoin and non-KYC Bitcoin, and they kind of have different values even, um, arguably two different currencies. Uh, that would be a situation in which you know, start nine as a, um, you know, as a company would probably uh, have to, you know, probably bow out of that situation gracefully, gracefully, I would assume, uh, or use it in the same way that the, that we use dollars, uh, which is to say, under regulation, uh, unfortunately, but the idea of start nine, if we are entirely successful, we will uh, make our core business uh, irrelevant. And we will then uh, ideally sprout up, um, new businesses around things such as support and uh, the other um, areas yeah. that would spring up in this industry. That, so, that's exactly our philosophy at content. To, by the way, that we don't see it as necessary. We can make money other ways. What we started out doing are probably not going to be the things that we do forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we will probably have to shift and uh, adapt around um, government pressures and, and various things. Hopefully, you know, hopefully it doesn't come to that. And, uh, you know, the better currencies uh, win out over the um, you know, centralized and government controlled ones. But uh, we are kind of you know, somewhat prepared for that. Maybe we need to have a little bit stronger contingency for exactly what you're talking about, because that does seem like it's right around the corner. 
just educating people about the nature of CDBCs is an important facet. I think all of us individually as well as company wide should should be striving to do with the people we talk to about cryptocurrency because you know we know how how evil it's going to be. We know how tyrannical it's going to be. So getting people be that that are mainstream or don't even know very much about cryptocurrencies, getting them to see the difference that there is a big difference between things that we we use um, and and the CDBCs, that's really key. Most people are, are clueless. They think of them as the same thing or the government's going to try and push them as the same thing in some respects. Yeah. 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 And I think to, to our the com community's benefit, this is the absolute wrong time to be pushing a CBDC. There's no doubt that you're going to get the most pushback, more so than the Federal Reserve being instituted. And uh, I think the one thing that is kind of a hopeful sign is that this is going to be U.S.-based regulatory issue. And with the splitting of the monetary system globally, that means that there's going to be spaces and other jurisdictions where these things will just be ignored. Mm. Interesting. It's a good thought. It's not a solution, though. The solution should be yes, but at least of course. it's better than that. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, a revolution that is happening and, and will happen on an individual basis and why things like this are so productive, like the the um hasnia bitcoin fund in my opinion is probably substantially more impactful than you know michael saylor buying tons of bitcoin and you know promoting it and like trying to be a spokesperson um and the reason is is because it's actually getting bitcoin into people's hands you know encouraging them to to use it um you know and think about it uh, and I think stuff like what's being discussed here is is underappreciated as far as its general impact. Um, I don't I don't think there's really like we we have the market behind our backs on this. You know, individuals are going to realize that they're being taken advantage of and screwed, or at least some will. Um, mm -hmm. and they're going to look for a way to opt out. Like, why would you like sane people are not going to choose suicide? Um, you know, which is the result of this economic system that's being proposed and, you know, even is the economic system that we currently live in. Um, you know, individuals like are really going to realize the importance of self-custody and actually owning their assets. Um, you know, FTX, uh, you know, made that clear, you know, but like globally, there's been an immense amount of bank runs happening, um, you know, and if you're relying on a pension right now, you're you're probably screwed. If you go and you look at pensions uh, across the board, like these traditional financial tools are, are just not um, effective in our Ponzi schemes. And like, okay, you know, Bitcoin is down, uh, but you can control your assets and you can, you know, move them freely and you can, you know, leave um, the jurisdiction that you're in um, with your assets. And that, that in itself is so, you know, incredibly powerful. Um, so I, I don't really see a future, you know, like there there might be like somewhat of a future where, you know, Bitcoin splits into to KYC Bitcoin and ethical, I like to call non-KYC ethical Bitcoin um, or default Bitcoin uh, because KYC is just, you know, an added restriction um, arbitrarily put there, you know, for individuals. But um, like nobody's going to stop me, you know, from accepting Bitcoin at any point. Like, I think like overall, you know, companies all have their guns, have guns to their head. They have, have to essentially have bank accounts, you know, to pay the, the thieves um, or coercers. Um, but, you know, individuals, you know, conducting commerce on the side is, is a very, very powerful. Um, uh, it, it's a very powerful thing uh, that I'm very, very excited about. Yeah, Bitcoin creates a lot of... Uh, uh, Alex, uh, a personal question. Um, <clears throat> would you consider yourself a Bitcoin maximalist or are you invested in other cryptos as well? Um, I'm, I'm, I 
think I'm more of a freedom maximalist uh, is what I would call myself, which I think leads me to being aligned with Bitcoin maximalism. Um, like I don't, I don't really get upset. So like, you know, say for example, I don't buy drugs, but like say for some reason that somebody goes on a, a dark net website um, and they only accept Monero, I'm not going to go after them, you know, for using Monero. But if somebody says, you know, Monero is the way that we revolutionize, you know, the financial system and, and take down the Fed, I will be um, disagreeable, you know, with that statement. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think um, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, is misguided. But yeah, I'm only I'm only interested in, you know, in Bitcoin personally. Um, um, you know, if people have legitimate use cases, like, you know, stable coins is a big part of, you know, you know the way our company uh, does commerce and it's be, um, really, um, the, the, um, things that stable coins are built on, um, like Ethereum and Tron are, I don't see them viable long-term. And I don't see the dollar viable long term. Um, um, so, I, I think Bitcoin's the solution. Like, I, I wish the Chinese vendors would accept Bitcoin, um, and that would make our lives easier. Uh, but they don't, you know, for the time being. So, um, but that, that's kind of my perspective on it. Like, I, I'm not like I used to be a lot more dogmatic about things um, than I am now. Like, I don't like sometimes it makes sense to, um, you know, mine altcoins. Um, I, I don't think it's generally a good way to go about things because I think it's incredibly risky and the economics aren't as stable, but you know, I don't go after people for doing it. I, I generally try to advise against it, but um it you know, for a very long time mining altcoins was a very lucrative way, you know, with graphics cards to mine at home uh, versus ASICs. Um and that has kind of been kiboshed for the time being, uh, because of Ethereum, which is kind of the argument against doing it, is because these people arbitrarily change their protocols. So, yeah. Are you, any of you, I know you're familiar with it, Matt, because I've spoken to you about it before, but, but are you familiar with a crypto project called uh, Quartal? Q-O-R-T-A-L? <clears throat> They're another a cryptocurrency project that uh, out of the thousands, of course, but they have very high goals in terms of trying to, we mentioned earlier that the Starline Labs had the idea of replacing the, the whole the whole infrastructure of the internet. Well, that's that's what the goal is of, uh, of uh, Cordal, and, and they've got a really good handle on a lot of the things that most other crypto projects fall into as traps. They don't ever want to be listed on an exchange, for example, um, and they, they really, the, the, the guys that are heading it up are are very good in terms of their freedom orientation and uh, their development staff is growing all the time. So, I, I mean, I can't really describe it in detail, but, but um, it's something that if you're curious about other cryptocurrencies, that would be one that I would recommend. Yeah, I, I would definitely suggest you look at them because I, I like them because they're so audacious. Uh, they do, they, their philosophy is just entirely different than establishment and they, they insist on certain things that people will say are just crazy. But it's working, so I like that. <laughs> There's Thank a lot guys. of contenders out there. There's a lot of them that we we don't even know about. You know, I mean, so who knows what what what, what might happen in the future? And uh, anyway, yeah, it's getting late, so uh, yeah. I'll uh, I'm going to be tapping off here too. But it's a fantastic uh, time here, Rayo. I appreciate you putting this together. And Bueller, good to you. Good to see you again. And, and uh, nice to meet everybody that was here. So thanks again for everybody. Hey, yeah, I got to go you. too. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you, Thomas. Like thank you. Bye. Well, have a good night, guys. Yep. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Much appreciated. So, all right. Uh, I guess that concludes the third Pasnia Second Realm Assembly. Um, don't really have uh, much else to add. That was, uh, yeah, definitely a. A long discussion, but I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it, found it of value, and we'll uh, um, keep a lookout for uh, future assemblies. I guess the next one might be 
uh, maybe a development meeting for Pirate Box uh, tutorial videos or something along those lines to, uh, you know, get these solutions out, um, you know, to more folks. So um, anyway, um, you yeah, stay in contact at uh, Paznia.com and uh, VanuPodcast.com. Uh, until next time, always remember Vanu is yours for the making and the Sec Realm is yours for the building. Uh, cheers from the Free Republic. The following is a Pasnia Department of Health and Wellness announcement, but is not to be taken or construed as medical advice. Today, it seems as if a self-liberator merely focuses on avoiding the chronic poisons of the servile society. Chances are, they are on the right track to outliving the coercers. I mean, sadly, most aren't looking so good and are severely lacking vitality. I know you've seen it too. But despite my tireless efforts in trying to educate myself, I'm still finding things whose significance I overlooked. Areas like heavy metals and excess linoleic acid, polyunsaturated fatty acids, immediately come to mind. Of course, I'm not saying I didn't realize heavy metals were bad, I just thought I was doing really well in avoiding them. That is, until I got a hair mineral analysis test back, which indicated high barium and arsenic, likely from gold seafood, and then high mercury levels too, potentially residual from Babylon pharmaceutical stabbings. And even a trace amount of uranium. Wild. Where in the shit would I come in contact with uranium? You know that saying, don't ask the question if you don't like the answer? This might be one of those times. You're probably like me too. You despise the murderous death cult that is Babylon Pharmaceuticals and how absolutely they hate privacy. Quack doctors don't know what tests are good either. In terms of blood tests, blood levels aren't indicative of tissue levels. Meaning just because you have such and such amount of it in the bloodstream doesn't mean it's getting into the tissues. A complete blood count and lipid panel can give you a slight insight into your metabolism, but way down the imbalance and disease process. Worse, these tests are basically captures into the system, steering people onto high blood pressure meds, statins, etc. Some liver tests can be valuable, though most everyone is chronically diseased and chronically poisoned, and so yeah, of course, liver inflammation enzymes are probably going to be elevated. I could have told you that. So then, what test can actually provide value? At current, speaking in terms of convenience, cost, privacy, and insight, it has to be the hair mineral analysis test via walk-in labs. Here's what you do. Go to paznia.com forward slash hair. This short link will take you to the aforementioned tests with our affiliate link. Place an order for the tests. The only valid information needed is a mailing address in which to receive a small envelope and an email address to receive the test results. When you receive their mail, read and follow the instructions. Then put the sample back in the envelope and drop it in the mail. Note, hair taken from the head will provide a short-term insight. Pubic hair is better for long-term, chronic insights. If you're interested in this test, the latter will probably be more worthwhile. Exact timing varies depending on location, but they will email or text you when your results are ready. See results! Now, if you've got any high heavy metals in particular, you've got a great target in terms of detox. You can choose specific homeopathics, herbs, or other chelators. For example, maybe supplementing silica to deal with aluminum, and maybe some zeolites or chlorella and cilantro for a general heavy metal detox. Further, you have 22 other nutrition points, essential elements to work with, helping you pinpoint specific deficiencies and proper ratios, uh, for example, copper to zinc or calcium to magnesium, etc. When you understand interactions and antagonists, much can be gleaned from this information. And you didn't have to interface with a doctor or really reveal any personally identifiable information to do so. It's likely you saved quite a bit of money too. Again, please visit pasnia.com forward slash hair and consider placing your order for a hair mineral analysis test today. And while I'm thankfully not a doctor, I'm always here to provide any assistance I can. Just email coordinator at paznia.com, and I'll get back to you ASAP. One more time, paznia.com forward slash hair, paznia.com forward slash hair, or to check out the catalog of tests they offer and support our efforts here at the Free Republic, just visit paznia.com forward slash walk-in labs. New Year. New You. The following was the Pasnia Department of Health and Wellness announcement, but is not to be taken or construed as medical advice.